a teenager is missing. A police investigation exposes the deaths of dozens of boys and young men. All are traced to a single killer. A photographer turns to rape and torture, meticulously documenting his crimes on film and audio tape. In a quiet suburb, four people are found dead. Police wonder about the kind of madman who could commit this crime. For serial killers, one death is just the beginning. Obsessed, they strike again and again, learning more with each crime, improving, perfecting. They're confident they'll never be stopped. But the mind hunters work tirelessly for their capture. It's just after six o'clock on January 23rd, 1978 in California, when Sacramento County Police arrive at the home of Terry and David Wallen. They are called there by a neighbor at David's frantic request. 22-year-old Terry Wallen has been brutally murdered. The house shows signs of an intense struggle between Wallen and her killer. She has been shot and her body slashed. A large knife wound runs the length of her torso. Some of her internal organs have been removed. Investigators are horrified by the viciousness of the crime. The scene becomes more gruesome when they find evidence that suggests the killer might have consumed Wallen's blood. Officers find a yogurt cup with bloody lip prints around the rim. Sacramento police don't know what to make of the scene, but they know who can help them. They call on a specialist, a man who's familiar with horrific and bizarre murder cases. His name is Russ Vorpagel. He is a special agent with the FBI. The brutality of the slaying makes Vorpagel fear that the murderer couldn't control himself and that Terry Wallen's death may be just the beginning of his rampage. There's just no need to disembowel a victim. There's no need to reach inside and cut out body parts. There's no need to cut a four-inch piece of major artery and take it along with you. I mean, hey, we knew we had a nut and we were worried and we knew that something's going to happen. Vorpagel called a colleague at the FBI. Robert Ressler has tracked and caught some of the world's most dangerous killers. As a criminal profiler for the FBI, he stakes out the darkest corners of a killer's mind. In the 1970s, he was one of the first to use the term serial killer to describe those who murder again and again. Robert Ressler is a mind hunter. Ressler struggles to understand the killer's mind by studying the crime scene. Knowing how the killer thinks is essential to predicting his next move. When will he strike? Who will he target? You have to have a emotional need to uh, solve a crime. You have to want to know who the offender was. You have to know what that person is, what he's like, uh, what he was like before, during, and after the crime. But there is a danger in identifying too closely with those who destroy. Ressler heeds the words of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, 
who wrote that whoever fights monsters should not become a monster himself, and that when one looks into an abyss, the unblinking abyss stares directly back. For Robert Ressler, Nietzsche's observation is motivation and warning. Looking into the abyss to me means looking into the depths the deep crevices, the dark crevices of man's human mind. And when it says the abyss looks back, to me that means I'm looking back at myself. I'm seeing my reflection. Because in, in every horrible killer, uh, yourself is in there somewhere in, in part. Somewhere in your life you could have gone that same road. In the 1970s, Ressler was yes, among the original members of the FBI's Behavioral right. Science Unit the first FBI program to systematically research a killer's motivations. Ressler interviewed some of America's most notorious murderers in prison to learn about their habits and attitudes. Today, Ressler is a private consultant who works all over the world to help solve serial murders. In January of 1978, Ressler applied his knowledge to help Sacramento County investigators devise a psychological profile of Terry Wallen's murderer. It was the first step in tracking the killer. Ressler began his profile by examining the crime scene details. What you look for at a crime scene is, is the uh, positioning of the body, the way the body was left by the killer. You look at the state of the body uh, from the standpoint of being clothed or unclothed, and of course, you, you're, you're looking for uh, available weaponry, or did the killer take a weapon to the scene, use it, and take it away? These are all things that you know, you really start sizing up in your head. After Terry Wallen was shot, the killer cut her body with knives taken from her own kitchen. Then he left them in plain sight at the scene, a detail that would prove instructive for Ressler. Because the greatest number of serial killers are male, at the time, Vorpagel and Ressler conclude their suspect is a man. They also assume he's white, like the majority of American serial killers. The brutality of the crime and the killer's apparent disregard for leaving evidence behind convince the pair their subject is mentally ill. That helps them pinpoint the killer's age. Ressler knows that mental illness usually begins in adolescence. It would take at least eight years for the killer to grow sick enough to perform the acts of violence he inflicted on Terry Wallen. Assuming symptoms began at age 15, Ressler figures the killer would be in his mid to late 20s. Any older, and he would have already committed several gruesome homicides. Ressler goes further. He believes the killer to be schizophrenic, a mental illness characterized by delusions, hallucinations, and bizarre behavior. Yes. Get out of here! Get out of here! The heinous nature of the crime points to full-blown psychosis, a total loss of contact with reality. Because he drinks the blood of his victims, investigators call him the vampire killer. From his office in Virginia, Ressler works feverishly with Vorpagel in Sacramento to refine the killer's profile. What would he look like? They are convinced police should look for someone thin. Male schizophrenics generally eat poorly when they eat at all. And Russ Vorpagel believes the murderer will pay little attention to his appearance. A guy that uh, is suffering from a major mental illness is probably going to have a deterioration in his hygiene. Probably doesn't cut his hair, wears the same clothes for weeks at a time, doesn't brush his teeth, is scroungy looking. Given his bizarre behavior, the killer would likely live alone. Vorpagel delivers a copy of the profile to the Sacramento police to circulate throughout the county. But no strong suspect emerges. 
the vampire killer remains at large. Will the profilers find him before he kills again? Sir. Three days after Terry Wallen's brutal murder in 1978, less than a mile away from her house, the vampire killer strikes again. Police find the bodies of Daniel Meredith, Evelyn Miroff, and her son, Jason. Missing and presumed dead is Miroff's 22-month-old nephew, Michael Ferriera. These new deaths convince Ressler and Vorpagel that unless this murderer is found quickly, he will strike again. The mind hunters redouble their efforts. Using information gathered from this crime scene, they refine their original profile. Again, the vampire killer shot his victims. Again, he used knives taken from the victim's kitchen. Two knives are found in the room and another was found outside. He doesn't seem to care that he's left the weapon behind. These details tell profilers that the killer is not planning his crimes. Although he brings a gun, he cuts the bodies with weapons he finds at the scene and then leaves them there. We, got there. we have a knife that was used to mutilate the bodies. It was taken yeah. from the kitchen, used on the victim, and then discarded at the, uh, at the crime scene. Uh, seeing this for a second time definitely reinforced in my mind that we were dealing with a highly disorganized killer. Organized and disorganized. Careful. These words describe a serial killer's behavior before, <coughs> during, and after a murder. Organized serial killers carefully plot their moves. They cover their trails so thoroughly that little or no evidence remains to tie them to their crimes. By contrast, disorganized serial killers act on impulse. Their behavior is random making their next move difficult to predict. Investigators find bloodstains in the bathtub. Profilers believe the vampire killer may have bathed in a mixture of water and blood. The crimes are becoming more gruesome and the killer more deranged and more disorganized. Now we know darn well that your normal everyday person is not going to fill a tub with water and bathe in the blood. So here we see personality, here we see mental illness, we see mental deterioration. From the evidence at the crime scene, Vorpagel and Ressler reconstruct the grisly sequence of events. And the terrifying portrait of a man they've never seen begins to emerge. The evidence reinforces the mind hunter's belief that the vampire killer's appearance will continue to deteriorate. He likely won't have changed his clothes. Unless he is single and living alone, the killer can't possibly escape notice. Their subject is a thin, disheveled loner, not more than 30 years old. Investigators are puzzled when murder victim Daniel Meredith's stolen red station wagon turns up a short distance away. Because it was found nearby, Ressler determines the vampire killer must have walked to the crime scene and then fled on foot after abandoning the car. The killer would be living, residing, uh, within a very close distance to that abandoned car. I said uh, approximately one quarter mile. The day after the Miroth murders, police receive an unrelated report that a dog has been shot and mutilated within blocks of the crime scene. For the mind hunters, it's the break they've been looking for. They know that as children, 
serial killers often mutilate or kill animals. And he would go out and kill these pets, shooting them with the same gun he shot Wallen and Miroth and Meredith, same gun, he'd shoot these pets. And then he'd gut them and drink their blood. As more animals are found dead, the circle closes. The mind hunters are convinced that the vampire killer lives near the slaughtered animals and his human victims. He won't have traveled far. Police circulate the revised profile throughout the city in hopes that someone may have seen a disheveled or strange acting man. Officers concentrate on a quarter mile radius of the murders. As a woman in her late 20s is leaving a Sacramento shopping center, a strange man approaches her. Hearing of the vampire killer murders, the woman contacts police. The man she eluded at the shopping center, she tells officers, is a former high school classmate, Richard Trenton Chase. She was shocked by his appearance. He had blood stains on his sweatshirt. His eyes seemed sunk into their sockets. A yellowed crust was around his mouth. According to the woman's description, Chase fits the profile of the vampire killer. Armed with a search warrant, officers enter Chase's home. They're unprepared for what they find. Nazi paraphernalia dominates the small apartment. The place is littered with pamphlets about alien conspiracies. The chaos in the living room fits the profile of someone with an equally chaotic mind. In the kitchen, police find appliances spattered with blood, as well as newspaper articles about the murder of Terry Wallen. Several dishes in the refrigerator contain human tissue. In a kitchen drawer are knives taken from Wallen's home. Investigators also find a toolbox and blood-stained rubber boots. Chase is arrested and charged with six counts of first-degree murder, including the killing of Evelyn Miroth's nephew, 22-month-old Michael Ferriera, whose remains are found not far from Chase's apartment. The jury deliberates only a few hours before pronouncing Chase guilty on all counts. The sentence, death in the electric chair. In 1979, Robert Ressler decided to talk to Chase in prison. Uh, the reason I interviewed him, very frankly, was to, to validate, to do an update and validate the, the profiling work that I had done, to talk to him directly after working on the case, after seeing the crime scenes, after reading the, now the, uh, the police reports and, of course, the, the court records. It's a way you really fine-tune fine your profiling. Chase tells Ressler that he had killed only to preserve his own life. He needed blood, Chase says, to survive what he called soap dish poisoning. Chase believed that a gooey residue under his soap dish proved he was dying. He claimed his blood was drying out and corroding his body. His killings, Chase contended, were made in self-defense. When he got down to the motivation, he said that the blood in his veins, the blood throughout his entire body, uh, was turning to powder or dust and that it was moving very slowly through his body, causing him to slow down, causing him to be fatigued and become very ill. And he felt uh, this was being done, of course, he said, by the, the influence of the unidentified flying objects and the aliens. And he said that the only way he could counter this was to get a fresh supply of human blood. What drives a man like Chase to murder? 
One FBI study of 36 serial killers revealed that although most began life in two-parent homes, by age two, almost half the boys' fathers had abandoned their families. Nearly half of the surveyed offenders reported cold or uncaring relationships with their mothers. 26 reported such relationships with their fathers. Nearly 70% of the families had histories of alcohol abuse. One third had histories of drug abuse. Almost all reported some form of childhood psychological, physical, or sexual abuse. As children, many serial killers tortured animals. The majority did not graduate from high school. While the men had the required intelligence to perform skilled jobs, most had poor work histories. Only 20%, or six offenders, had ever managed to hold on to steady work. Yet, to all appearances, serial killers seem normal, like your neighbor or your friend. Uh, most of these people are like everyday uh, people. They, they uh, oftentimes are intelligent, they're attractive, they're good conversationalists. Uh, IQs usually up about, uh, at least high, normal, or beyond. And they're very deceptive. Ressler was opposed to the death sentence for Chase. Chase, he argued, was mentally ill and should have been locked up for life in a prison hospital. Prison psychiatrists eventually agreed. Chase's sentence was commuted to life in the California medical facility in Vacaville. But Chase killed himself in his prison cell just after Christmas, 1980. He had stockpiled his antidepressant pills and then taken them all at once. Richard Trenton Chase's brief and chaotic reign of terror had come to an end. In contrast, one of America's most cunning serial killers was also one of the most organized. Highly intelligent and a talented photographer, this murderer specialized in kidnapping, rape, and torture. Police called him the unidentified subject, or unsub. He was a master of planning. He used film and audio tape to record his crimes. In a rented storage shed, he stockpiled pictures of his victims and recordings of their anguished cries. He was so meticulous that he would leave virtually no evidence of his atrocities, except for the photographs he took himself. Unsub customized his cars to resemble unmarked police cars. He added heavy-duty suspensions and strong restraints so that once inside, his victims had virtually no chance of escape. For five years, he traveled from state to state, never staying in one place too long. He was self-reliant, financing his crimes of kidnapping, rape, and torture with yet another crime. He was a skilled counterfeiter. He was confident that he would never be caught. In Manassas, Virginia, a team of former FBI agents pursue some of the world's most dangerous criminals. They call themselves the Academy Group. Between them, they have amassed years of experience investigating serial killings. Robert Hazelwood and Peter Smerick are experts in psychological profiling of criminals. If you in life are an impulsive person, you act without thinking, well then that crime scene may be very, very sloppy and be a reflection of your impulsive acts. On the other hand, if in life you're a cold, calculating individual, you don't take any unnecessary risks, well that type of behavior can also be demonstrated at a crime scene. Even with crime scene evidence, categorizing serial killers is difficult. Some serial killers demonstrate a mixture of disorganized and organized habits. All too often, 
if an investigator starts looking at a crime scene and tries to put the offender into one of these nice, neat little categories, he's going to be disappointed when the person he arrests doesn't fit these categories in all areas. In the seaside resort of Ocean City, Maryland, a young woman has just finished her shift at a convenience store. It is Memorial Day weekend, 1979. She is approached by a man who identifies himself as a police officer. He shows her his identification and is driving an unmarked police car. He tells the woman she is a suspect in a series of robberies and he insists that she accompany him to police headquarters for questioning. He handcuffs her and pushes her into the car. It's the beginning of the longest and most terrifying experience of the woman's life. The man is no police officer. He is unsub. She's his latest victim. He takes her to a deserted building where he repeatedly rapes and tortures her. He photographs and tape records the ordeal. I think one of the buzzwords today that we use is power and control. And whether you're dealing with a rapist, whether you're dealing with a serial killer, I think it still comes down to those two basic elements, power and control over the life of another individual. Eventually, he will push the dazed woman back into his car and take her for one last ride. He stops the automobile, opens up the passenger door, and rolls the woman out into a ditch. but he did not kill her. He allowed this victim to live. And as a result, within a number of hours when daylight came, she was found, she was rescued, and now became a full-fledged FBI investigation for kidnapping. The FBI set up a massive manhunt for unsub. The Ocean City woman was the latest in a long list of his victims. Some were tortured, others murdered. But many years passed before there was a break in the case. At the same time the FBI searched for unsub, the Secret Service was on the trail of an elusive counterfeiter, a man who routinely passed fake $20 bills to unsuspecting store clerks at malls and shops in the Midwest and on the East Coast. The one thing about any law enforcement agency, no matter how good we are, you need an element of luck and you need the cooperation of an alert citizenry. In this instance, an alert clerk recognized a composite sketch as a customer who was currently in the store. She notified mall security, mall security notified local authorities, and within a short period of time, the suspect was apprehended. The man police arrest is James Mitchell de Bartolaben. The Secret Service soon discovers that de Bartolaben is not just a counterfeiter. Secret Service agents search a storage unit rented by de Bartolaben. Inside are sheaves of the fake currency he's been passing. But to their shock, agents also discover a grotesque treasure trove of pictures and audio tape. The 1983 discovery unmasks the focus of the FBI investigation. Robert Hazelwood, then an FBI special agent who had written a criminal profile of unsub, reviewed the material seized from DeBarta Laban's storage unit. Agents find thousands of photographs of DeBarta Laban's victims. 
Among them are photos and audio tape of the woman abducted in Ocean City in 1979. Some of the photos date back to the early 1960s. They find the tools of a killer's trade. Victim's clothing, 10 guns, phony police identification, journals, blood-stained lingerie, and jewelry. Seven license plates allowed de Bartolaben to roam with little fear of his car being traced. The FBI also found handwritten notes. They contained codes that referred to past and future crimes. Although they have uncovered de Bartolaben's cache of damning images and sounds, agents have a problem. The killer's face remains literally out of the frame of the pictures he's taken with the victims. Investigators will have to prove de Bartolaben is the man in the photographs if they are to tie him conclusively to the rapes and deaths. During his FBI career, Peter Smerick was a forensic photography expert. The Secret Service sent him a number of de Bartolaben's photos to analyze. Several show a naked torso and uncovered arms. Smerick focuses his attention on the arms. They have a distinctive pattern of small moles and freckles. Smerick asks the Secret Service to temporarily remove de Bartolaben from his prison cell in order to photograph him in the same position as the person in the confiscated photos. The gambit pays off. When Smerick compares the photographs taken by the Secret Service to the ones found in the storage unit, he finds the patterns of freckles match. It's the proof agents desperately seek. In all the years that I've worked as a criminal profiler, I can't think of another case where the offender was such an excellent photographer that unknowingly he took his own crime scene photographs, which ended up putting him in prison. In 1984, de Bartolaben was tried and convicted. Today, he is in a federal penitentiary in Texas, sentenced to multiple life terms. De Bartolaben was one of the most dangerous criminals that ever walked the face of the earth, in my opinion. He was able to commit a number of crimes over a number of years in a variety of states and never have those crimes linked to him. That made him extremely dangerous. I think he's involved in a lot more crimes than we're aware of, yes. By controlling every variable, weapons, location, and victim, the organized serial killer can slip through any dragnet, getting away with murder for years as he hides in plain sight. Such was the case of John Wayne Gacy, a prominent Chicago area businessman, well-liked and respected, Gacy camouflaged a terrible secret. In 1978, in Des Plaines, Illinois, 15-year-old Robert Peast was reported missing. Having learned that Gacy was preparing a remodeling bid for a drugstore where Peast worked, Chief Detective Joseph Kozenzak of the Des Plaines Police Department goes to Gacy's home. Gacy denies knowing Peast. But investigators are suspicious. A background check reveals Gacy was once convicted of the sexual abuse of a teenage boy. Kozenzak places Gacy under surveillance. Initially cooperative with the police, Gacy becomes increasingly surly as Kozenzak's investigation continues. He had a real mean look in his eyes. You could uh, feel that there was hatred there and that he really didn't care what we were investigating and was more concerned about trying to stay out of the way. Gacy threatens a lawsuit if police continue their surveillance. Officers persist, suspecting that Gacy has much to hide. But even they are not prepared for what they'll find. 
For several weeks in 1978, Des Plaines police didn't let John Wayne Gacy out of their sight. Finally, it came time to search his house. The search uncovers a photo receipt that belonged to Robert Peast, linking Gacy to the boy's disappearance. A more thorough search would reveal even more. Chief Detective Kozenzak was the first to enter Gacy's home. I was one of the first people that arrived at the house and went in through the back door, walked in. The whole place was just dark and kind of eerie. All the window blinds had been closed. And there was some sense of, uh, I don't know, it was kind of ominous actually. Because we were starting to believe that there could be people buried underneath Gacy's house based on the information we'd gathered. Police interviewed Gacy's ex-wife, friends, and former employees. Stories came out that Gacy propositioned his workers for sexual favors, that some had disappeared, and that his house had a strange odor. One of his workers suggests they check the crawl space. After rigorous questioning, Gacy admits to detectives that four years earlier, in 1974, he killed one of his homosexual partners. Gacy claims the murder was in self-defense. He hid the man's body beneath the floor. Then, Gacy shocks investigators. He confesses that he murdered almost three dozen young men and boys, also hiding many of their bodies under the floor. The confessions trigger an intense search for the missing men. Detectives examine the crawl space in the hope of finding Gacy's victims. They uncover three decomposing bodies and parts of other bodies. But the police don't stop with the crawl space. Knowing more bodies must be stashed under the house, they cut away the floor to find them. Eventually, they would find bodies buried under the dining room and garage floor. Under the house is a virtual killing field of buried bones and jumbled skeletons. Police arrest Casey for the murder of Robert Peace, though the bodies they uncovered were dead too long to be the missing boy. Casey, um he figured that the best way uh, not to get caught for his crimes was to keep control of his victims after death. But when you're a psychopath, a sexual psychopath, he figured nobody would ever find those bodies down there because he was too smart. Smarter than police, smarter than everybody. By stashing his victims in his own home, Gacy maintained total control over them, even in death, and could remain confident that no one would ever find them without his knowledge. Such careful attention to detail from planning to death, is the mark of a highly organized killer. Everything about the case, uh, uh, especially when, when viewing the, the, the home inside, would indicate that Gacy was highly methodical, very well planned, and that he had thought these crimes out in great detail prior, prior to embarking upon them. Gacy also dumped his victims in the Des Plaines River. Police recovered six more bodies there. One of them was Robert Peace. When it was over, police identified the remains of 33 people. Bob was very interested in this process because the FBI was formulating within their behavioral science unit kind of an in-depth study of P 
people who commit a series of killings and wanting to know more about them, wanting to understand them, and this was a classic, classic case. The goal of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit is to map the mind of the serial killer. So many people believe that it's the, the sexual act itself that he's performing with the victim that is of primary importance to him. In reality, it's the entire game that's important to them. The selection process, the surveillance, uh, knowing that I have selected you to become my victim and you don't know it. Right. And then all of the planning that goes into the stages of actually conducting the abduction. And so they are rehearsing this and living this maybe for weeks or months before the actual abduction occurs. And to a certain extent, the sexual activity afterwards may almost be an aftermath. With each killing, Gacy refined his methods, learned from his mistakes, and improved on his successes. He carefully lured his victims into a well-designed trap, distracting them with weightlifting, plying them with alcohol, and showing pornographic movies. Bring it down to your chest, all the way down. Okay, can you bring it up, you can lift it up. He eventually grew so confident that he brazenly targeted a boy from his own neighborhood. Many victims came to Gacy's home hoping to get a job with his contracting firm. He'd meet with them in his garage. The soundproof garage was designed by Gacy and constructed by his company. A motorized door was the only way in or out. If his victim didn't object, Gacy would demonstrate a magic trick using trick handcuffs. Like, like this, real good, right? Okay, ready? After showing how the handcuffs work, Gacy would persuade his victim to try them. Then he would challenge him to attempt the trick behind his back. If the victim agreed, the trap was sprung. Gacy would switch the trick handcuffs for real ones. Once immobilized, the victim was at Gacy's mercy. Hey, come on, man. One, two, three, try to twist it. Only Gacy knows exactly what happened oh, next. Relax. Come on, Bobby, relax. Yeah. Okay. Like serial rapist and killer James Mitchell de Bartolaban, Gacy thought he had completely covered his tracks. But mementos found during the search of Gacy's home provided key evidence, though police didn't know it at the time. Detectives discovered driver's licenses, belt buckles, rings, and other personal effects. Ressler alerted investigators to the importance of these objects. We, we had actually found these items not fully realizing what we had found until after Bob came in and started pointing out to us that to you a belt buckle is not important, but to the person who committed the crime, it's very important. It's a, it's a visual process to help relive the crime at any given time that he wants to do so. The souvenirs are a reminder of his past murders and an inspiration to kill again. To Gacy, this is, is some sort of a, a uh, symbol of his success, a, a, a reminder. It enhances his fantasy and carries him on to the next uh, next victim. Uh, trophies, I call them for the serial killer, uh, where they kind of uh, enhances their fantasy to have these objects around. The most disturbing object found in Gacy's house was a map indicating job sites around the United States where he had worked as a contractor. Ressler believes it's likely that Gacy wouldn't have confined his killings to Chicago. 
and it only seemed logical that uh, if Gacy's traveling doing this in, in Chicago, he's doing it elsewhere as well. That's why I firmly believe that John Gacy killed more uh, than the 33 he was convicted of. I think probably maybe twice that number. Forensic teams dismantled Gacy's house. In all, they recovered 27 bodies there. How many more Gacy killed, police would never know. For 10 years, starting in 1979, Ressler interviewed Gacy in prison. Ressler was surprised to learn that he had grown up four blocks from the killer in suburban Chicago. Gacy even remembered delivering groceries to the Ressler family, recalling in detail the distinctive flower pots that Ressler's mother used. Gacy also had darker recollections. He described for Ressler a turbulent relationship with his father. Ressler wasn't surprised. Nearly all the serial killers he knows of tell similar stories. And it's all documented. I ran away from home, as you know, when I was 19 years old because I couldn't get along with my father. I mean, he was just overbearing. I was dumb and stupid, never would amount to anything, and so I just took off and just to hell with it. I was gone for three months. From prison, Gacy made a painting and sent it to Ressler. It depicted Gacy dressed in a clown costume. When I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could, you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. You know how people, uh, if you're a businessman, you, you've got to keep a certain rapport and stuff like that, and everybody looks for you for an image. But as a clown with the makeup on, you, you could be slapstick and funny and have a good time. That's why I always enjoyed clowning. In Gacy's painting, he stands in a grove of evergreen trees, surrounded by balloons. The inscription on the back reads, you cannot hope to enjoy the harvest without first laboring in the fields. Gacy refused to explain the painting's meaning to Ressler or to anyone else. Ressler believes the painting hints at many more murders Gacy committed. Uh, he said, you can get away with a lot of things when you're, when you're behaving as a clown, because people see you as something funny, they see you as something as amusing, they don't know what's beneath the grease paint, they don't know what's beneath the cloth. He said clowns can get away with murder. John Wayne actually, Gacy died you know, by lethal my, injection case, on May 10, 1994. Since the early years of criminal profiling in the 1970s, other serial murderers have been identified and caught. Such names as Son of Sam, Ted Bundy, and Jeffrey Dahmer have become known to mind hunters and to a public alternately fascinated and repelled by their crimes. Serial killers are driven by control, by dominance, by discipline, by uh, uh, authority. They have very warped concept, concepts of, uh, of uh, uh, interaction with another human being. They don't look at another human being as a human being. They look at them as an object. Robert Ressler believes that serial killing, while not limited to the United States, has intensified in this country since the end of World War II. Part of the reason has to do with a culture that glamorizes and encourages violence. Culture produces, you know, uh, produces violent crime. I would say 75% of the world's serial killers are uh, American products. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it sounds very strange, but it's one of our, you know, it's like America, you know, it's like uh, baseball, uh, you know, apple pie mom and serial homicide. It's uh, uh, unfortunate, and it's, uh, it's certainly uh, tragic in a sense, but it's, it's one thing in, in the world of criminology, the United States is... Uh, absolutely uh, broken all records. Profilers must take care that the poisonous thoughts of those they track don't pollute their own. For one who stares into the abyss, there is a danger of falling in. Ressler says that mind hunters must work their way back from the brink every day of their lives. Uh, I've maintained a balance, uh, I think, consciously by isolating myself from the horror of what, what I see. Uh, at, uh, I go to work at 8, I quit at 5, uh, I go back to a, a normal life, I uh, have a drink, I watch uh, the news, uh, I cut the grass. Uh, 
I've kept a perspective. I've kept in tune with the mainstream and the normal people of society. For Wrestler, profiling is less about drama than about analysis. Observe, think, conclude, and realize there are no easy or quick answers. And the movie concepts is that the profiler will solve the case. Everybody can fold up their tents and go home. Uh, profiling is one tool in the overall toolbox of the investigator. It gives him one more dimension, uh, one more piece of that puzzle. And uh, when you put it all together, sometimes it's very effective. Profilers explore the mind's darkest regions, dragging what's hidden into the light of day. Only then can it be examined and learned from. The value of profiling, as in this case of Richard Chase, is to give the police some concept, some psychological portrait or an image of the logical type of subject that they're looking for, to give them a clear picture, because otherwise it's just uh, an empty room. These human monsters feel they can never be caught, that they are invulnerable. Yet, with each new victim, each drop of blood, each fiber or DNA strand left at the scene of a crime, the mind hunters probe deeper into the killer's mind. Perhaps the day will come when profilers won't be needed, but for now, the mind hunters will have to continue looking into the abyss. In a church parking lot, a woman is found murdered. The killer leaves few clues and no weapon. A routine suicide investigation takes a macabre twist. Can a camera prove this was murder? and a fire rages in a nursing home, killing 15 residents. Armed only with his photographs, it will take the coroner six years to prove this tragedy was no accident. Forensic photographers solved these crimes by preserving crucial details missed by the naked eye. After the evidence is erased, the new detectives must rely on camera clues. In Fairfax County, Virginia, in March 1989, a man called police to report a woman had fallen in an icy church parking lot. An officer reported back from the scene. The woman didn't slip and fall. She was murdered. At police headquarters, forensic photographer Jeff Miller knew he had a long night ahead of him. He packed his equipment and got ready to meet investigators gathering at the scene. Where some officers shoot criminals, Miller shoots film. In his 18 years with the Fairfax police, he has witnessed countless crime scenes through his lens. If he is the eyes of law enforcement, then his photos are its long-term memory. Yeah, this is the, uh, the ID we got off the victim. Uh, Investigators arrived at the parking lot and planned their strategy. Detective Ed Guckenberger headed the investigation. As his team uncovered clues, they depended on Miller. It's in Miller's camera that all the clues come together to solve a case and hopefully to catch a killer. We want to be able to document the scene, in essence, take the scene from here to the courthouse just exactly the same way that we find it. Miller began by mapping the crime scene. The initial clues were both simple and brutal. The victim was lying face up in a pool of her own blood. She had been shot several times with the fatal bullet to her head. Nearby, her purse was found untouched. Robbery was not the motive. 
Miller first documented the wide view of the crime scene, which was blanketed in darkness. To bring it into focus, Miller used a technique called painting with light. The camera was mounted on a tripod. Its shutter kept open as an assistant covered the lens. The same frame of film was exposed repeatedly as Miller passed along the edges of the scene, firing his flash as many as 24 times for a single picture. Each flash illuminates a slightly different area. This photograph is the result of Miller's work. The bright lights look like street lamps, but they were made by Miller's flash. Though he was holding the flash as it fired, Miller doesn't appear because he was behind the light. He remained invisible as he exposed the evidence. After Miller took his wide shot by painting with light, he moved in to photograph every detail of the scene. He worked his way closer and closer to the victim, documenting her wounds and the position of her body. Miller discovered some bloody tire tracks near the victim. Officers were sent to follow the trail, while others stayed behind to comb for additional clues. Miller found two bullet casings. The man who called the police parked his van over them. Miller photographed the evidence where it lay. Moving the van again would only have disturbed more of the crime scene. Hey guys. As Miller hunted for additional evidence, officers returned from their search of the neighborhood. They found an abandoned car a block away. They ran the tags. It was registered to the victim's address. The sight of the car became a second crime scene. Again, Miller photographed the scene from every angle, hoping to uncover any clues that might explain how the woman ended up so far from her vehicle. As he did at the church parking lot, Miller first photographed the site at a distance, then moved in for close-ups. The driver's side window was shattered. Pellets of glass were strewn about the car's interior. A spent cartridge lay in the snow outside the driver's side door, and a bullet was lodged in the plastic molding. On the passenger's side, Miller found even more. Pressed into the thin snow were footprints, too big to be the victims. Forensic technicians have a tough time making casts of snowy tracks, and Miller knew the prints would melt with the rising sun. So it was up to him and his camera to preserve the evidence before it faded away. You can cut it out if it's in ice and try to, to, to keep it at a certain temperature and everything else. Well, uh, I guess sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there are different... Uh, you know, chemicals that you could possibly spray on it to, to, to try and keep it. Uh, uh, when all in all is said and done, the photograph is the only evidence that was able to uh, totally keep that uh, impression intact. The search of the neighborhood uncovered more potential evidence. A patrolman found a second car abandoned a half mile from the church parking lot after apparently skidding off the road. The second car became the third crime scene during this night of sporadic clues. Police began to search for a connection. On the seat, an officer found a leather gun holster. He ran the tags on the vehicle. The owner lived just two doors from the victim. 
process this scene. At dawn, Jeff Miller inspected the church parking lot again. He hoped the sun would shed new light on the case. By now, the snow had melted. We wanted to come back and check the asphalt parking lot and make sure that uh, we collected all the evidence. We don't want to leave anything behind. Once we leave here, you know, you can't come back. His effort hey, paid off. Just go ahead and put some of the glass Daylight revealed fragments of glass buried in the snow the night before. If the glass matched the broken window in the victim's car, police could say the car was in the parking lot when she was killed. Okay, there's something over here. The melting snow also okay, revealed a bullet at the edge of the lot. So tell you what, let me get a couple pictures of it first. Tests would determine if it matched the bullet found in the victim's car. While Miller checked the parking lot, Ed Guckenberger hit the road. His first stop, the victim's house. In homicide cases, family members are usually the first suspects. I have to read very quickly once I knock on that door the type of response that I get from that person who opens it. And in this case, I had a husband that was dressed in a, a bathroom that I had woken up out of his sleep. He stated that uh, his wife should have been home and she was at a church meeting. As a homicide investigator, what you then have to do is you have to read that person because he seems sincere. Is this some ploy or something else? Well, there was nothing from what he was telling me to show that he was in any way involved in this. Confident the husband wasn't involved with the woman's murder, officers followed their next lead. They didn't have far to go. The owner of the second car was the victim's neighbor. He was also no stranger to police. The churchyard murder investigation was less than 10 hours old. So far, Detective Guckenberger had no suspects. His only lead was the owner of the second car. The man police wanted to talk with was Gary Asa Donahue. Ed Guckenberger asked him to come to the station for questioning. To his buddies in his motorcycle gang, Donahue was known as Redneck. Police knew him by his criminal record. Donahue told police he'd been out drinking the night before. When he got home, he realized his dog was loose, so he drove around to look for him. He lost control of his car on the icy road and skidded into a ditch. Unable to get free, Donahue said he walked home. Although his route would have taken him past the victim's car, Donahue told police he didn't see it. He said the holster in his own car belonged to a friend, but he didn't have the gun. Police were suspicious. They asked Donahue for his jacket and boots, which might hold clues that told a different story. Donahue willingly surrendered them. In the dark room, Miller developed one of his most hopeful leads. Up until now, he'd been merely documenting the various crime scenes. Now, he put his dark room skills to the test to flush out latent clues. Using the ruler he placed by the icy footprints when he snapped the photo, Miller created a life-size portrait of the prints. A boot print can be almost as telling as a fingerprint, if it's clear enough. Miller was happy with the photo. Armed with this image, it became just a matter of matching the prints to the boots that made them. 
Miller sent his photographs to a forensic lab for a detailed comparison with Donahue's boots. Lab technicians first examined the size of the boots. If the prints are off, even by a few millimeters, there is no match. The tread pattern was examined next. Technicians pored over the sole of the boot, making sure that every detail matched Miller's photograph. So far, so good. But next came the litmus test, matching the boot to the foot that wore it. It required a close look at the boot's anatomical wear. An anatomical wear is the wear that each of us impart into the bottom of the shoe based on how tall we are, how much we weigh, our bone makeup, how we walk, whether we walk on the inside of our feet, the outside of our feet, more so on the heel, more so on the toe. Donahue wore a lift in one of his boots. It added to the unique anatomical wear and left its signature in the boot prints. Last, technicians examined the boots and the photographs for accidental wear and tear, nicks and cuts from daily use. In this particular case, there are certain marks, certain cuts, certain indentations in the tread pattern that the examiner was able to see in the photograph and was able to find also in the shoe that he's able to say that this shoe made this impression to the exclusion of all the other shoes in the whole wide world. The footprint evidence placed Donahue at the victim's car. Buchenberger credits the photographs with keeping the investigation on track. If we didn't have the photographs of that shoe impression, then we're mainly just stuck with firearms evidence person might have a gun, but who actually shoots that gun? Uh, but this person wears his own boots. Investigators then examined Donahue's jacket, combing it meticulously for fibers, hair, cloth, anything that might link Donahue to the victim. They found glass particles. What new information could they provide? Forensic tests determined the glass, the glass from the victim's car matched the glass in the parking lot. If the glass from Donahue's jacket matched these samples, it would place Donahue at the site where the car window was shattered and where the victim was killed. The glass matched. Police could now prove that Donahue was in the parking lot and maybe in the car at the time of the murder. The bloody tire tracks were the next link. Because the victim couldn't have driven through her own blood, investigators were able to show she was killed in the parking lot and that somebody else moved her car. As the car, her car, was leaving the scene, it drove through a pool of blood that was coming from her. The blood adhered to the tire, and the rotation of the tire through the parking lot kept leaving a blood transfer onto the, to the ground. And so that's what that was from. The scattered clues were coming together, thanks in large part to Miller's accurate documentation of the scene. The only thing missing was the murder weapon. To help pinpoint it, investigators tested the bullets and casings found near the victim and her car. Another casing was found in Donahue's car. Lab tests showed all the casings were fired from a rare Hungarian pistol, a 9mm auto-loading Fromer, a gun that peaked in popularity around World War II. Tests of the impression on the holster from Donahue's car matched the impression a Fromer would make. But the gun was nowhere to be found. Police scoured the area and came up empty. Donahue, for all his earlier cooperation, drew the line at providing the gun, swearing he never had it. And he probably thought that whatever he did with this gun, and I don't know, we never did find that gun, uh, probably thought that he was past all this. That if we didn't have a gun, we probably could not prove that he was the one that actually uh, fired the shot or did anything else. But if there ever was a smoking gun in this case, it was Miller's photographs of the boot prints, something Donahue didn't count on. A 
Officer Miller and Detective Guckenberger began to build their case. With the glass fragments, the shell casings, the bullets, and the ever-important boot prints, they were confident they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Gary Asa Donahue was a killer. Okay, great. Miller's photographs became primary evidence before a grand jury, which sent back Donahue's indictment. The photographic clues that Miller provided helped piece together the story of that ill-fated night. Okay, what I believe happened is that Mr. Donahue's driving down the street. He turns down the wrong street to go to his house, probably because he's drunk. Donahue lost control of his car and slid off the road. Angry, he got out of the car and began to walk home. As the victim came down the street, she recognized the car. She likely had seen it in her neighborhood for years. Donahue bought it from another neighbor. Perhaps she's acting as a good Samaritan. She stops to offer him a ride. Or perhaps he stepped down in the road and flagged her down. The other possibility is he stepped out in the road with the gun and made her stop for him. They go down the street to the church parking lot. Something occurs inside the car in the church. I don't know what that is. In homicide investigation, you're not always going to be able to answer every single question that you have. falls down to the ground, lays down on her back, face up. Donahue then, as a better target, a non-moving target, he then advances towards her, and as she's lying there on the ground, he puts the gun right up to her face almost and executes her. He then leaves the scene, drives down to the end of the street, where again, for whatever reason, he runs off the road, probably due to his intoxication, runs off the road, wrecks it into the trees. For whatever reason, he decides to clear his weapon. He works the action, the one cartridge casing that's still in the gun. He ejects out the broken driver's window and is found uh, on the ground next to the, the vehicle. For whatever reason, he slid across the seat and left by the passenger's side leaving his boot prints in the snow. This is your worst type of killer. Because this is the person that kills out of meanness. There was no reason at all to kill this woman. Uh, she was not... Uh, you know, your, your, your victim that puts herself in a situation because of a crime. She's not that type of person. She's the type of person that her innocence is what got her into trouble. That day, she ran across an animal. Gary Asa Donahue was sentenced to life in prison. The senseless death of the woman in the church parking lot shocked the residents of her quiet community. Further south, in Miami, Florida, murder is more common, but no less shocking. Through these doors at the Metro-Dade County Morgue in Florida come every kind of death, both natural and unnatural. As bodies come into the morgue, it's the job of forensic photographers to document wounds and other identifying traits before the corpses are stored. The work is never routine and often tragic. On this day, a five-year-old girl is the victim of a random shooting. She was caught in crossfire during a parade. Forensic technicians examine her wounds. Perhaps they hold the key to the killer. Dade County detectives rely on the information to start their investigation. We are trying to determine, uh, number one, what caliber of round it was that did strike the victim. And number two, the path of the bullet 
as it entered the body and then uh, exited that will help us in trying to determine possibly who our shooter is. In the medical examiner's office, high-tech photography is as much a tool of the trade as a scalpel. If a death looks suspicious, it's up to forensic photographers to document the details. They start with the wound and then photograph individual organs as the autopsy proceeds. These gruesome photographs survive long after a case is closed. They provide a visual database authorities can refer to if a similar case comes up. Knowing what to look for streamlines any investigation. In 1986, Dade County Police responded to a suicide. Jack Sebastian lay dead, a 12-gauge shotgun by his side. When death is involved, it's standard procedure to capture everything on film. Did you see anyone enter or leave the house? The victim's girlfriend told police she was outside when she heard the blast. I want to get everything. Sebastian left no note. At the morgue, a staff member felt suspicious about Sebastian's wound and called medical examiner Jay Barnhart. Good morning, Dr. Alvarez. What do you have, Doctor? This case came to his Barnhart mapped and measured the wound. Which appears to be an In his initial opinion, this was no suicide. Sebastian was shot almost directly between the eyes. His wound was surrounded by stippling, small speckled burns made by the gunpowder exploding from the shotgun's muzzle. If Sebastian held the gun directly to his head, the gunpowder wouldn't have marked his face. From the stippling, Barnhart knew the gun must have been held some distance from Sebastian's forehead when he pulled the trigger. Something wasn't right, and Barnhart was determined to get to the bottom of it. First, Barnhart ordered photographs of Sebastian's wounds. Then he took x-rays of Sebastian's head to reveal the internal damage he couldn't see. The x-ray showed the path of the pellets. This is an x-ray showing the dispersion of the bird shot through the skull. And if we take the point of entrance, which is just above the bridge of the nose, and connect that by an imaginary line or series of lines to the location of the pellets, we see that the pellets are to the left and below the point of entrance, meaning that the shot then was coming from above and to the right of the entrance. Barnhart had to find out if Sebastian could hold the gun at the angle indicated by the X-ray. It wouldn't have been easy. Investigators even placed the shotgun in the extended arms of Sebastian's corpse to see if he could fire the gun. His fingers could barely reach the trigger. Considering all possibilities, investigators tried to fire the gun with their feet. They found they could do it with bare toes. But Sebastian wore round-toed boots, making it impossible for him to fire the gun. These extreme tests were necessary. Barnhart knew that in court, he must be prepared to answer even the strangest questions. I mean, now I ask you things like, well, couldn't he have been laying in bed and have his foot up over his head and, and pulled it with his... Uh, and if he'd not been wearing shoes, uh, you'd probably have to say, yes, he could. Barnhart wasn't satisfied with his findings. He needed to determine the distance between Sebastian and the gun when it fired. Barnhart and his staff shot a piece of poster board from distances of one to seven feet and examined the damage. From one foot away, the force of the shot cracked the board. The impact was enormous. At two feet, 
the impact was less severe as the buckshot began to spread. At four feet, the hole roughly doubled in size as the pellets fanned out. At six feet from the board, the buckshot dispersed further, leaving clear pellet marks. Barnhart concluded the muzzle of the gun had to be at least one and a half feet away from Sebastian's head. He was convinced someone else must have pulled the trigger. But Barnhart feared his simple test wasn't enough to sway a jury. He turned to the Forensic Imaging Bureau for help. Todd Reeves runs Dade County's Forensic Imaging Bureau, one of the best in the United States. The Bureau has more than 3,000 square feet of advanced photographic equipment. The well-equipped studios can document huge pieces of evidence while capturing clues invisible to the naked eye. Here, a technician uses a microscope-equipped camera to examine a cast of a jawbone. Her findings will help match a suspect to a bite mark. A potentially useful image may come from a less than perfect source, like a security camera or shot from a moving vehicle. The lab can clean up, enlarge, and enhance photographs. Computers reveal unseen details in evidence photos, bringing clues into focus. A huge computer database of fingerprints can match even the vaguest finger smudge. An editing suite helps investigators assemble persuasive courtroom presentations. So the higher the quality, the better delineation you're giving the jury, the more factual information. And that's what we're providing is fact, not fiction. And uh, that's the true message behind professional forensic photography. Jay Barnhart knew he had a case for the murder of Jack Sebastian. But he'd rely on Reeves and his high-tech tools to make it bulletproof. Got a case of this bike. Every fatal wound tells a tale. In the case of Jack Sebastian, the injuries around the wound completed the story. When a gun fires, it shoots more than projectiles. From the muzzle comes a flash of fire, a blast of gas, a puff of smoke, and a shower of sparks. Each can leave its mark. Place the muzzle of a gun directly against the target, and all this debris goes into the wound. Pull the muzzle further away, and the debris becomes more and more dispersed. The forensic photographs of Sebastian's injuries showed the stippling wounds. They also revealed bruising under the eyes, on the nose, and on the cheek. Barnhart believed the damage was caused by the open petals of the shot cup, a plastic sleeve that holds the buckshot. But how far away would the shotgun have to be to allow the shot cup petals to open? Barnhart and Reeves believed high-speed photography could provide the definitive answer. And it allows the doctors and the police uh, that are investigating the case to be able to see things we can't see with the human eye, things that are moving as fast as Mach 15. High-speed photography can stop a bullet in mid-air. More than that, it allows investigators to examine frame by frame, the impact and damage that bullet produces as it connects with its target. Wounds can then be matched with bullets. In cases where no weapon is found or a bullet isn't recovered, a series of high-speed photos may help investigators make the identification. Reeves and Barnhart designed an experiment to determine the distance between Sebastian's head and the muzzle of the gun that killed him. It's, I don't know if there's any, I think we can have film in the 35. Uh, crank it in there after it's in the vise. They mounted a shotgun on a rack, held perfectly level. 
Next, okay, they position the two cameras so along the line of fire. As the shell and debris left the muzzle, they would fly past the cameras, which would snap their picture. It was crucial that the gun not move when fired. They loaded the gun with the same type of ammunition that killed Sebastian. Fire in the hole. Okay. Reeves then placed a sensitive microphone near the muzzle of the gun. When the microphone picks up the sound of the shotgun blast, it trips a flash unit. A ruler placed behind the microphone measures how far the shell travels as the shot cup petals begin to open. The high speed flash fires for one half millionth of a second, necessary when photographing at blazing speeds. For the clearest image, Reeves and Barnhart need the camera to be as close to the flying shell as possible, but must determine the best place to put it. They first try the test with a large format Polaroid camera. The fast developing film allows them to take test photos of the experiment so they can position the second camera correctly. For the actual test, they use a standard 35 millimeter camera with highly sensitive film to freeze the shell in its path. The investigators are now ready to try their experiment and catch a shell with a flash of light. If all goes well, they'll produce an irrefutable record of the shell and its components in flight. Barnhart can then use the information to verify where the plastic petals on the shot cup began to open into the pattern that damaged Sebastian's face. Each time the gun is fired, Reeves inches the microphone away from the muzzle. As a result, the flash will go off a little later. The projectile will travel a little farther. The camera will catch it as it opens in flight. Initially, the white-hot plastic shot cup hasn't expanded. After 18 inches, the petals begin to spread, discharging the pellets and falling away. At about 30 inches, the petals have fully opened. Barnhart and Reeves succeed in making a photographic point-by-point -point map of a shotgun shell's trajectory. By comparing the wound with the pictures, investigators determined the gun was fired from a distance of 18 to 24 inches from Sebastian's yeah, face. Gonna, uh, uh, the results corroborated Barnhart's own experiments and gave him the evidence he needed to prove Sebastian couldn't have possibly shot himself. Police then confronted Sebastian's girlfriend, Diane Shelton, with the evidence. She confessed to pulling the trigger and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Unlike any other tool, forensic photography can expose evidence that would otherwise have been missed. And sometimes, photographs are the only way to prove a crime was committed at all. When a Pennsylvania coroner was certain a tragic accident camouflaged a mass murder, his photographs became his only allies. Forensic photography played a crucial role in the investigation of a devastating fire in a nursing home. Retired Wayne County, Pennsylvania coroner Robert Jennings spent six years trying to prove the fiery deaths were no accident. Jennings has spent much of his life combining his role as coroner and his love of photography. He has been snapping shots for more than 45 years. His story begins on the grim night of October 19, 1971. A fire killed all 15 residents of the Geiger nursing home a private home attached to a farmhouse near Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Most of the victims were found in their beds, dead from smoke inhalation. 
A few were overcome as they crawled on the floor. As coroner, Jennings rushed to the scene. State police and firefighters had begun removing bodies before Jennings had a chance to document the area. After asking the firemen to stop, Jennings began photographing all he could. The location of the victims could prove important. Jennings tried to track the blaze with his camera lens inside the pitch dark building. Time was of the essence. He went right to work, hoping his pictures could help determine what caused the blaze. But the darkness and smoke foiled his efforts. Reluctantly, he went home to await the sunrise. By the time he returned the next morning, the smoke had cleared and the gloom had lifted enough for him to get his shots of the ruins. If your normal f-stop would be uh, f-11, then you would have to open up at least two more stops and give it more light to get the uh, detail and so forth that's needed in this type of uh, evidence photography that at least arson experts have an opportunity to examine uh, the charring and so forth. Working in the crumbling shell of the building was time-consuming and treacherous. But Jennings was determined to commit every inch of the wreckage to film. He succeeded. Painting with light revealed details of an alligator burn, a charring pattern similar to the rough scales of the reptile. The pattern is created at very high temperatures. By illuminating the area from several angles, Jennings photographed the changes in the burn pattern. Later, he would refer to his photographs to trace the fire's path. Burn patterns on the walls suggested the blaze tore through the hallway. A section of the corridor was almost totally consumed. In one spot, the fire burned a hole in the floor the destruction at this spot was unlike anywhere else in the building. Jennings focused his attention and his camera on the hole. He crawled under it, photographing its edges. Fires usually burn from the bottom up, igniting whatever's above them. But at this spot, the fire looked to have burned from the top down. To Jennings, that suggested an accelerant was used some flammable liquid that seeped through the floor, carrying flames with it. Before Jennings completed his investigation, state police announced their findings. They concluded the fire began in the laundry room, caused by a bad thermocoupling in a clothes dryer. Jennings wasn't buying it. He'd spend the next six years trying to prove them wrong. Photographs were Jennings' only clues. The ceiling above the dryer where the state police said the fire started showed minimal damage compared to the highly charred hallway. The wires in the laundry room were still intact. Jennings even found unburned clothing inside the dryer. Picture by picture, he continued building his case. Today, a quarter century later, Jennings' evidence remains, though the building is long gone. Within a few weeks after the fire, the building is totally destroyed and demolished, razed. So therefore, uh, the evidence that I photographed, that's gone. And if you don't have the photographs there to support, to look it over, uh, it's pretty hard to solve a crime. For Jennings, not much has changed in the art and science of photography since he snapped his first picture. 
Today, as he did 25 years ago in the Geiger nursing home case, he processes his own photographs by hand, carefully controlling every step of exposure, developing, and printing. He sharpened his skills, both as a photographer and an investigator. He's gained a better sense of what to look for and how to capture it on film. A charred piece of timber, a pile of debris. These seemingly trivial objects can be clues that make or break a case. Jennings has to be sure no detail is overlooked. An investigation is a lot like a roll of exposed film. All the information is there. You just have to know how to make it visible. In his darkroom, Jennings exposes many secrets. And in the process, he sometimes develops even more questions. State police were impressed by Jennings' photographs, but still wouldn't concede the fire was arson. They didn't waver for one simple reason. No suspect. If the fire had been deliberately set, who lit the match? In the end, Jennings' pictures exposed him. Hoping to prove the fire was deliberately set, Jennings turned to nurse Vaudine Lyon, the sole survivor of the blaze. She told him about one of the home's gentlest patients, Mr. Maurice Flynn. Mr. Flynn, a deeply shy and private man, would end each day in his room reading the Bible by candlelight. So it was odd that after the fire, Flynn's body was found seated in the room of a married couple. He was the only patient not in his own room when the fire occurred. He was also the only patient found completely naked. Scarcely burned, he died seated in a chair with his arms and legs extended as though crucified. He was known as the gentleman of the house. He was there to help people, uh, but he was very private. He wouldn't even leave a, a nurse or anyone with him when he's taking a shower. He, he just didn't want any help. And this was always a puzzling part as to why this particular person was found this distance away. Flynn's own room was some 60 feet from where his body was found. The smoke and flame would have made that simple walk impossible. Jennings determined the blaze started at the intersection of the hallways. In order for Flynn to get to the couple's room during the fire, he would have had to pass right through it. On the other hand, if he wanted to escape the blaze, the exit was near his room, easily within his reach. And it's impossible that he could have come down that distance and through that T-intersection with the type of uh, uh, physical evidence that we found on his body, uh, because he, he, he would have never made it and he would have been completely charred. Jennings wondered why Flynn was so far from his room while most everyone else died in bed from the fast-spreading blaze. On June 8, 1972, Robert Jennings exhumed the body of Maurice Flynn. Even before the autopsy, Jennings noticed something odd. Flynn's skin was almost cherry red, indicating carbon monoxide poisoning. The autopsy showed Flynn's lung tissue had absorbed gasoline vapors shortly before he died. More clues came out during Lyon's interview. Flynn was the only resident in the home allowed to have matches. Matches to light the candles by which he read his Bible. He also mowed the lawn around the nursing home, making him one of the only residents with access to gasoline. Flynn behaved strangely the day before the fire, ranting and citing biblical verse. The home's other residents also acted strangely. They paid off forgotten debts and talked of a journey to a better place. Everything uh, 
centered around the strange events of Mr. Flynn, why he was completely naked. One of his comments to one of the nurses on, on duty that day was that you come in this uh, world naked and you leave it naked. And that stuck in our minds a lot with finding his completely nude, nude body. It looked like Jennings had his suspect. But state police wouldn't revise their conclusions. Jennings persisted. By early 1975, Jennings was confident that he had enough evidence to prove his case. He exercised his powers as coroner and swore in a jury of six men and women. He presented his findings while the state police defended their position during the two-day legal battle. Afterward, the jury concluded the fire was caused by an illegal act by a person or persons unknown. They ruled that investigators should attempt to discover who caused the 15 deaths. Why Flynn set the fire will never be known. Some have speculated that his actions were the result of a deranged mind. Others have said Flynn and the other nursing home residents had all agreed to die, thinking it better to end their lives than live in the home. In the end, the closest we may ever come to finding out the cause of the fire lies in Jennings' photographs and his efforts at solving this crime. After the coroner jury's verdict, Jennings filled out the death certificates of the residents of the Geiger nursing home. 14 homicides and a suicide. It was worth the effort I felt that I had a duty uh, to represent the other 14 people that paid a price their lives in, in this particular incident and, and particularly for the families as well. Forensic photography is the new detective's secret weapon. Often overlooked, it is crucial in a criminal investigation. Through sophisticated camera equipment, determination, and ingenuity, forensic photographers become the eyes and memories of investigators. They are also the advocates of the victims, helping bring criminals to justice. Investigators in Canada are on the trail of a killer. The key lies in the victim's cells. But has fire destroyed all the evidence? At a murder scene, a handful of cigarettes provides the only clue. Will forensic detectives be able to unlock their secret? This young man was imprisoned for a rape he swears he didn't commit. Can science prove he's innocent? When police are stumped, they may turn to detectives in lab coats to uncover clues hidden inside the human cell. One strand of DNA can finger a killer or set the innocent free. The new shape of crime detection is a double helix. In July 1991, a janitor in Vancouver, British Columbia made a routine trip to the dumpster. But what he found was far from routine. Inside lay a body burned so completely he wasn't sure it was human. He ran to call police. Across town, detectives Al Catley and Rick Crook responded to the call. The homicide investigators had done this drill before. What may look like a human body sometimes turns out to be a practical joke, a discarded mannequin, or some other case of mistaken identity. They hoped that was all it was. 
Still, they had to check it out. So when we walked over to take a look at inside the dumpster, uh, there was just the outline of a human body. And in fact, it was so badly destroyed by the fire that uh, it was questionable as to whether it was human or we've had some instances of uh, bear carcasses being destroyed after illegal hunting or something like that. And we didn't rule out that possibility. You can't. No. The, no. Thing is, though, the officers approached the dumpster carefully, and, uh, making note of details that could become important later. The dumpster was cool to the touch when they arrived. The fire had been out for hours. A stain spread from the corner onto the pavement. Whoever set the blaze used more than enough flammable liquid to destroy the contents. A close inspection of the contents confirmed that this was no false alarm. There, amid the ashes of computer boxes, wooden flats and scrap paper, lay a human body. After the detectives made their notes, the delicate removal of the fragile evidence began. It was gently placed in a body bag so as not to damage it any further. Then it went to the morgue, where a pathologist would examine the body for clues to its identity. Anything else that survived the blaze was also collected and sealed. Surveying the scene, the detectives realized the murderer selected his site carefully. An industrial park closed for the weekend, surrounded by brush and trees. In fact, we did establish that people were driving by roughly the time that we think that the homicide occurred, or the burning occurred, and there wasn't anything. You could have quite easily have driven up here and probably out without really seeing what you would have thought was a fire. Homicides are often solved in the first 24 hours when investigators follow hot leads. But in this case, the fire had gone out. The trail had grown cold. If the murder happened just five years earlier, Crook and Catley would have relied solely on hunches and their talent for bulldogging a case until they had the answers. But by 1991, when this victim died, Crook and Catley knew they had an ally in the lab. A powerful new tool had been added to crime solving, DNA profiling. Investigators no longer needed a shred of evidence to solve a case. They only needed a single cell. As personal as the whorls and lines of a fingerprint, but far more difficult to hide, DNA is the next wave in scientific sleuthing. Today, scientists can extract DNA on a sweat-stained hat left by a nervous killer. From saliva on the stamp of an extortionist's letter. Or from dried blood or skin scraped from underneath a victim's fingernails. Microscopic evidence has always been left behind by criminals. Only with the advent of DNA profiling has it become incriminating. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, contains every detail that makes you human. Back to where it was. No two people, except identical twins, share the same patterns. DNA is small enough to fit inside the nucleus of every cell. Its shape is a double helix, like a spiral staircase wrapped around a column. Uncoiled, the double helix would stretch to eight feet. About 99.5% of everyone's DNA is the same, but some sections vary greatly from person to person. By studying those sections, scientists can identify victims and unmask murderers. In the Virginia Division of Forensic Science in Richmond, Paul Ferrara runs one of the most progressive DNA testing labs in the country. With the sensitivity of this technology, I don't know that I could go in and commit a violent crime and, and just not somehow leave something of me behind. And that's all it takes with this technology, just some little piece 
of me that's got a, a cell with a nucleus in it, and I'm in deep trouble. Heat is the enemy of DNA, and fire is the bane of forensic investigators who try to recover DNA from torched crime scenes. A week after the victim was found, Crook and firefighters recreated the inferno to see if it could shed some light on the crime. Whether by design or accident, the killer left one lid open, creating a downdraft inside the dumpster. The rushing air whipped the flames into a frenzy. The surrounding trees hid what little smoke the fire produced. It burned at about 2,000 degrees for 30 to 40 minutes. By comparison, a crematorium burns between 1,000 to 1,400 degrees for about three hours. Police were lucky to have any remains at all. Now they had to figure out who was killed here. All the pathologist could tell them was that the victim was a white female. Traditional methods at a standstill. Detectives focused on x-rays. They showed the victim was shot in the head, but they also revealed a feature so detectives hoped would identify her. David Sweet, a forensic odontologist or dental investigator, worked on the case. Teeth are the hardest substance in the human body and the most difficult to destroy. When bodies can't be easily identified, odontologists look to the teeth to tell them about the victim. Their wear and condition can hold the story of a person's life. Whether they were right or left-handed, drank water with fluoride as a child, or wore braces. By studying the victim's teeth, it was determined that she was in her early 20s. She had one extraordinary feature. But the other thing that we realized when we examined the teeth was there was an extra tooth right in the center of the upper jaw between the upper uh, central incisors. And those showed up very well in the x-rays that were taken after the uh, victim died. Crook ran a computer search that compared his findings with dental records of missing persons. None matched. Despite his best efforts, Crook was stymied. He still had a victim without a name and a murder without a suspect. Meanwhile, somewhere out there, a killer ran free, confident nothing could link him to his crime. What he didn't know was that a small piece of evidence could provide the missing link. For two days, Detective Al Catley chased a ghost. Who was the woman in the dumpster? What awful chain of events led to her murder? Surely by now, someone, a friend, a lover, a co-worker, was missing her. Catley asked his staff for missing persons reports. One stood out. Lynn Breeden, age 30. Her roommate filed the report. He had dropped her off at a friend's house. The friend saw her leaving a nightclub around 3 a.m. the night before the burned woman was found. She left with an unknown man. Three days later, a woman posing as Lynn Breeden tried to empty her bank account. The woman presented a withdrawal slip with Breeden's account number. Hi, I need to make a withdrawal. Okay. The teller knew she wasn't who she claimed to be. When she questioned the imposter, the woman became flustered. When the teller tried to detain the woman, she hurried out. I need you to stay here. Wait, I gotta go. No, I need you to stay here. A security camera captured the failed transaction. Analysis of the film revealed a man waiting for the woman in the parking lot. Police made a photo of the woman from the tape and ran it in the newspaper. She was identified and called in for questioning. She told police a friend had offered her $500 to scam the bank. She knew nothing of the murder. 
The friend was Chris Cruz, an exotic dancer who used the stage name Tony Devins. Detectives placed him under constant surveillance, then asked him to come in to speak with police. Not realizing police were watching him, Cruz parked his car two blocks from the station and walked the rest of the way. The surveillance officers called Sergeant Crook to tell him they thought Cruz must be hiding something in his car. When Cruz arrived at the station, police asked if they could search his car. He told them the car was at his parents in another county. They knew he was lying. They told him they knew where he parked it and they didn't need his permission to search it. Reluctantly, he handed over the keys. Forensic investigators took pictures of the car from every angle, carefully recording what they saw before touching it. They moved in closer to gather more evidence, collecting and photographing virtually everything. It was too soon to tell what might be important later. The men worked in teams. Some officers inspected the evidence, while others marked where it was found. Investigators found blood stains on the sides and rear of the car. They marked the positions carefully. Later, the shape of the stains would be analyzed to calculate what direction the blood came from and its point of origin. These details are crucial for reconstructing a crime. Blood samples may also be collected for DNA analysis. Police searched the car inside and out. They looked through personal items in the back seat, hoping to find any piece of evidence to tie the victim to the car. All right, it's 10.05, we're going into the trunk. Next, they opened the trunk. Oh, look at this right off the bat. Inside, they found a gas can and other objects covered with blood. Beneath some clothing, they found several key pieces of evidence, a bloody tire iron and a 22 caliber rifle. I'd say that's the, the deal. The detectives Mr. now were almost certain Cruz killed Lynn Breeden, but they had no way of connecting the suspect to the victim. Cruz denied knowing her. He told friends he bought her identification on the black market, and police couldn't prove the blood on the car was hers. They needed to compare the DNA from the blood on the car to DNA from the victim. But where could they find the victim's DNA? They turned to David Sweet for help. He suggested looking for it in her impacted wisdom teeth. No one had ever tried it before, but it was their last hope. We know um, theoretically that there are cells still embedded in the mineral tissues of the teeth and we should be able to open the teeth, extract those uh, cellular materials and extract the DNA from the cells and then process it in a forensic DNA analysis. A tooth is an armor coating that surrounds a core of living tissue. Sweet hoped the tissue within the impacted wisdom teeth were protected from the fire by the thick jaw bones surrounding them. He cut the first wisdom tooth from crown to root, but found no tissue inside. His second attempt was more successful. He found tissue, but he didn't know if its DNA was destroyed by the fire. He sent it to the lab to be tested. All he could do was wait. Did Chris Cruz kill Lynn Breeden? The answer was in a forensic lab in Vancouver, where the victim's tissue was sent for testing. Finally, Dr. Sweet received the results. The DNA survived the fire. What's more, further testing showed the DNA from the victim matched the DNA from the blood in Cruz's car. The lab calculated the odds that it wasn't the victim's blood were one in 540 million. Dr. Sweet proved 
that Lynn Breeden was in the car the night she died. These, listen, I need that money. Do you know Confronted with the overwhelming evidence, Chris Cruz confessed to murder. Based on interviews, detectives pieced together a likely scenario of that fatal night. I'm sorry. Breeden once borrowed a great deal of money from Cruz. Now he wanted to collect. Breeden refused to pay him. Cruz lost his temper. Growing impatient, she got out of his car. shoved her body in the trunk, and drove to the dumpster. After he arrived at the secluded spot, the victim began to regain consciousness. Chris Cruz shot her. would erase all the evidence. How could he know the charge of murder would come from his victim's own mouth? Found guilty of second degree murder, Chris Cruz received a life sentence. In rural Clay County, Alabama, a drive along Route 31 leads to a town caught between memories and progress, where turn-of-the-century storefronts share billing with a new city hall, where folks still get their news word of mouth, and where bad news and good news travel at about the same speed. Summertime slow. It's a safe place where parents don't think twice about giving their teenagers free reign to explore the land. A place where violence is an unwelcome stranger. On July 22nd, 1995, three riders on all-terrain vehicles discovered a burned mattress in the woods and beneath it what appeared to be blackened bones. They contacted Sheriff Ralph Tolan, who responded to the call. You think you've got a body? Three miles. Three miles east of 49777. Okay, we'll be on our way. The men met the sheriff and led him to their grim discovery. It looked like murder. Toland began to secure the crime scene, but knew he couldn't do it alone. He needed to be sure no evidence was jeopardized. I got down into the scene and I saw exactly what had happened. Saw the mattress charred and burned. Nothing left but the springs over, over a shell. And I just stopped everybody where they were at and told them to stop right there. Had them to go back out to the uh, entrance to the, from the road and ask them all just to secure it. I wanted forensic and the criminalist 
to come and help us collect this, all the evidence. The man he wanted was Angelo Della Manna, a scientist with the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences. Della Manna never knows what he's going to find when he answers a call. Whenever you get to a crime scene, you hope that it's been secure and cordoned off right after the discovery of the body. You don't want anybody into the crime scene that doesn't belong there. You don't want anybody messing up evidence. You want the evidence to be maintained in a secure fashion so that when you as a scientist get there to recover it, you can collect it without disturbing it, preserve it, bring it back to the laboratory, and do the tests that you need on it to find out who did the crime. Della Manna marked the position of the body, the condition of the mattress and the surrounding area before he went to work collecting everything he could. Della Manna placed flags to mark the position of what little evidence he found. He marked 11 used cigarettes randomly scattered around the mattress. They hadn't been there long. That was a good sign. But who smoked them? The killer? The victim? I felt it was going to be very hard not only to identify that person, but to generate some kind of evidence. Um, I did feel at the crime scene that there were the cigarette butts present there were going to be very strong evidence because they did not look weathered. They were sitting up on top of the cushion of grass. I felt they had not been there very long. As Della Manna assessed the situation, his technicians recorded the evidence. Since technicians don't want to leave part of themselves behind, they wear gloves. Della Manna's people had been trained so they don't unwittingly destroy the very clues that they're trying to save. If forensic scientists are careless in how they collect, store, or process evidence, they'll leave themselves vulnerable to attacks in the courtroom. After the evidence was marked, photographed, and recorded, okay, technicians okay. carefully collected it. Bodies don't just turn up without someone missing them. Sheriff Toland already had a yeah, sinking like suspicion about, about who the victim was. The week before, Jimmy uh, Paris called him to report that his I'll wife, Peggy Laughlin, was missing. Sheriff Toland decided it was time for his deputies to pay Paris a call. You can't think of anywhere else you might have gone? It was no secret around town that the couple had more than their share of knockdown, drag-out fights. No one would be surprised if Peggy just decided to up and leave. Meanwhile, the medical examiner compared the victim's backbone to spinal x-rays of Peggy Laughlin. They matched. Jimmy Paris became the prime suspect. But where was the evidence? Paris denied being anywhere near the woods that night. Della Manna tried to put the pieces together, but he didn't have enough of them to complete the picture. The forensics team turned up nothing at the crime scene. The cigarettes were the only clue untouched by the fire. The answer must lie with them. Detectives told him both Peggy and Jimmy smoked. You can be looking at a case and, and feel going in that there isn't very much evidence there. The investigators don't think there's very much there to work with. But when you, as a forensic scientist, find that small piece of evidence, that one link that can either nail the suspect or clear a falsely accused individual, the rush that comes from that makes all the long hours worthwhile. If he could lift DNA from the cigarette filters, he could compare it to the DNA of Paris and Laughlin. If he could prove they were together in the woods, Toland could make a case against Paris. Della Manna shined an ultraviolet light on the cigarettes. The light revealed the saliva-soaked areas. DNA can be obtained from saliva and lip cells. He marked the outline of the glowing portion he wanted to test. Then he carefully trimmed it away and sent it to the lab for DNA profiling. To build a DNA profile, what we do first is we take our evidence sample, blood or saliva or whatever the DNA is in. Okay, we, what we do is we break open the cell and release the DNA. So we extract the DNA from whatever it's on. 
We clean it up and we look at specific areas or addresses on the DNA and we make millions of copies of that area big enough so that we can see it. Once the DNA profile is done for each person in the case, we can then compare it to the evidence DNA profile and see if, it, see if there's any matches there at all. He was encouraged by the results. The lab identified DNA from two people and two of the cigarettes held DNA from both people meaning they shared their smokes. Could Della Manna prove those two people were Jimmy Paris and Peggy Laughlin? Testing Paris's DNA was simple. Cooperating with police, he gave a blood sample, which provided ample DNA to analyze. But getting Laughlin's DNA proved much more difficult. Delamana had to try extracting it from her remains. He felt the best place to look for the DNA was in the marrow of the femur, or thigh bone. The largest bone in the body, it's the one most likely to have protected DNA from the fire. Bone marrow is rich in DNA. To expose as many cells as possible, Delamana ground it into a powder. He gave the powder to another scientist for DNA extraction. The scientist places the powder into a chemical bath that breaks open the cell's nuclei, releasing the DNA. Once the DNA is in the solution, Bone fragments, chemicals, and impurities must be removed. The liquid goes through a series of microscopic filters. A centrifuge spins away the refuse. The filters trap the clean DNA. Theoretically, scientists can obtain DNA from just one cell. But to create a profile, they generally need thousands though that number is decreasing. Not long ago, tests required a sample the size of a dime. Today, they can extract usable DNA from a drop of blood the size of a pinhead. The DNA is isolated. Now it's time to measure it. When the DNA is drawn through a membrane, it creates a band of color. By comparing the color, scientists can determine how much DNA they have. Delamana examines the results, which appear as small dark bands on a piece of film. DNA is measured in minuscule quantities called nanograms, or billionths of a gram. The test results tell Dalamana whether he has enough DNA to work with. Unfortunately, there's only about 0.3 nanograms of DNA in that sample. That's point and then nine zeros in a three grams of DNA in that sample. Delamana didn't have enough usable DNA for testing but he this had an ace up his sleeve. A scientific man. process so revolutionary, its inventor, Carrie B. Mullis, won the Nobel Prize. Up until 1993, scientists could test DNA only if they had large quantities. But bacteria, heat, and time take their toll degrading DNA and leaving it in fragments. A process called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, enables scientists to make multiple copies of DNA. DNA is made up of four chemical units, adenine, A, thymine, T, guanine, G, and cytosine, C. These units are strung together like beads. A joins only with T, and G joins only with C. PCR works by splitting apart the double-stranded DNA like a zipper. The thermocycler heats the DNA, 
separating the A from the T and the G from the C, essentially unzipping the helix down the center. More of these chemicals are added to the solution, and the two halves of the helix use them to make themselves whole. Repeat the process, and the two become four, and so on, until millions of copies are created and the sample can be measured. When making a DNA profile, scientists don't need to compare the entire DNA molecule. They only look at several sites along the helix. If these sites are the same on both samples, the DNA most likely came from the same person. It's considered a match. Scientists used PCR to create enough DNA from the bone to do a profile. But the quantity and quality of the DNA was poor, so they could measure only one site. But in order to make a match, they needed to identify at least two sites. How could they find that second site? Delamana knew that a child's DNA is a combination of both parents' DNA. To solve Peggy Laughlin's murder, Delamana needed help from her brothers and sisters. If he could do their profiles, then he could work backward and calculate Peggy's. Once we knew we didn't have enough DNA to build Peggy's complete DNA profile, we had to go and get a blood sample from every one of her brothers and sisters that were in the United States. These samples came from all over the United States. As Delamana's investigation continued, Sheriff Toland received a call about an abandoned van found in a neighboring town. A license check showed it belonged to Jimmy Paris. Inside, forensic scientists found blood on the ceiling and walls. Part of the carpeting had been torn out. I tell you what, Dan, right. above your head, right above your head. Whoa, yeah. You got three. I see it. Based on this evidence, they obtained a search warrant for Paris's home. Hey, Jimmy. Hi. Sorry to borrow you. Let us in. That'll help us just fine. Stand aside there. Back off with the gun. Deputies searched the house for any clues that could link Paris to his wife's death. But they found nothing. Then an officer checked the crawl space and found a section of blood-soaked carpet. It matched the missing piece from Paris's van like a jigsaw puzzle. The possession of the carpet linked Paris to the bloodied van. Police had the murder scene, they had the victim, and they had their suspect. The evidence was strong enough to arrest Jimmy Paris for the murder of his wife. But to strengthen their case for conviction, police needed to link Paris, the van, and the burned mattress together. To do that, Paris had to be placed with the victim just before her death. Angelo Delamana was hard at work trying to accomplish just that. He was ready to make Peggy's DNA profile using the blood samples from her siblings. We extracted them, put them through our full battery of DNA tests, and what we did was when we got the DNA profiles of the brothers and the sisters, we were able to work backwards and build the rest of Peggy's profile. The genetic information Delamana gathered from the siblings enabled him to complete the missing link on Peggy's DNA. Peggy's DNA matched the DNA on the cigarettes. Here was proof that Peggy was alive with Jimmy in the woods the night she died. For forensics expert Paul Ferrara, the DNA match was the kind of evidence that tipped the scales against Jimmy Paris. When looking at DNA evidence and the weight that you put on that DNA evidence, take that and place it in perspective with other evidence of motive, means, and opportunity. And when you combine all of those together, then one can come to a, an informed opinion that a person is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Paris had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill Peggy Laughlin. 
he was a jealous man. And he'd begun to suspect Peggy of infidelity. On that night, he invited her into the woods. He brought along a mattress, placing it on the ground and covering it with a blanket. Peggy and Jimmy smoked and talked, casually tossing aside the spent cigarettes. There, in the saliva and lip cells, lay the code of the murderer's identity, waiting to reveal its secret. Then, something happened that triggered a rage that drove Jimmy Paris to homicide. The baby is crying too. Will you just leave the baby? No, I'm going to go with the baby. You hear me? Paris knew he had to destroy the body if he wanted to escape detection. couldn't find a body, they couldn't link him to the crime. He couldn't see that the evidence he had already left would be enough to convict him. DNA analysis was crucial in the sense that it placed both the suspect and victim at the scene together. Um, and in that case, having those small pieces of evidence allows allowed us to put a guilty man in prison and allow the family to put closure to a terrible incident. In Alabama and Vancouver, scientists struggled to find DNA evidence to link a killer to his victim. But the power of DNA is not just its ability to put people behind bars. It also holds the key to setting them free. Attorney Barry Sheck, part of O.J. Simpson's criminal defense team, doesn't believe everyone behind bars is guilty. Using DNA, he's making a strong case. Sheck heads the Innocence Project, a program at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law in New York. The program is dedicated to exonerating the innocent through DNA profiling. Serological Institute. Mm -hmm. Sir, um, yeah, right. Sir, and that they had, they had actually responded, we have something, but not enough to test. Check provides the expertise. The students do the legwork, sifting through hundreds of cases, looking for those with the most promise. Once cases are identified, the students investigate whether the evidence still exists. If it does, they see if it can be used for DNA testing. I don't know. There's, not, there's, there's nothing in the Red Well 2 yet. It became clear to us that DNA had the power to go back into old cases, um, re-examine it, and exonerate people that had been convicted many years ago that lots of people felt might be innocent. The Innocence Project helped exonerate 30 of the 40 people released through DNA since the project began in 1992. Today, startling FBI statistics show that one quarter to one third of all DNA testing at its lab clears a suspect. No one knows how many innocent people remain in prison across the United States, but the Innocence Project is doing its best to find them. Now we have all these cases of people who have been convicted who can credibly come forward and say, look, I didn't commit this crime. There was serological evidence that was introduced against me. There was hair evidence that was introduced against me, for example. Um, please test items in my case. It'll prove me innocent. 
and that's happening in case after case after case. What were the uh, circumstances of the identification? Louise Huckberg is the executive director of the Innocence Project. In 1993, a convict named Troy Webb appealed to her colleagues for help. He trusted DNA to prove he was innocent of rape. Troy Webb first wrote to us in 1993, and I understand from Troy that the way he got to us was through his cellmate, who apparently was also a client of the Innocence Project. Webb was arrested in 1988 after a rape victim picked him out of a photo lineup. Eyewitness identification has led to most convictions where defendants were later proved innocent through DNA profiling. Hochberg believed in Webb's innocence, but it would be three years before she and her students returned him to his family in Virginia Beach, Virginia. The principal criteria for us is, number one, can this person make a credible claim of innocence? And number two, the most important, is there biological evidence in the case that we can test which combined with other factors will be determinative, will prove that this person um, did not commit the crime for which he or she was convicted. The Innocence Project had evidence in the case sent to Paul Ferrara's forensic lab in Richmond. There, scientists compared DNA from evidence left at the rape scene to DNA in a blood sample from Troy Webb. The level of the technology, even 10 years ago, was such that we couldn't eliminate Troy Webb, for example, as the possible contributor of the genetic material. But by the same token, we wouldn't have been able to eliminate a large percent of the population. Before they could start the testing process, the lab had to retrieve genetic material from evidence stored seven years earlier. Once it was identified, they had to see if it contained viable DNA. They used an acid test to confirm the biological fluid was present. If the fluid is present, the indicator liquid turns purple. Another method is to use a light source, called an omnichrome, that makes fluids glow. If the scientist is looking for blood to test for DNA, she'll use a chemical called luminol to find it. Luminol can detect the faintest trace of blood, making it especially helpful in instances where blood may have been washed away by rain or where a killer has tried to remove it. In Troy Webb's case, investigators swabbed the evidence from the victim's clothing. The sample would contain the perpetrator's DNA. They'll compare it with Troy's DNA. Comparing DNA is a matter of comparing the lengths of strands of genetic code at specific points on the double helix. Scientists place the DNA sections they want to yes. compare uh, into a gel. The DNA has a negative charge, so scientists can use a positive charge to pull it through the gel. The longer pieces travel more slowly than the shorter pieces, so two pieces of the same length would move the same distance. If the DNA from the evidence and the suspect move the same distance across the gel. Scientists know they're the same length and they have a match. If the segments don't move the same distance, they couldn't belong to the same person. The segment lengths can be seen and measured under lights that make the DNA fluoresce. These are the printouts of the actual DNA profiles in the Troy Webb case. They fade with time, so scientists take photographs for a permanent record. Scientists needed to compare only one site on Troy Webb's DNA strand to the DNA from the evidence. If it didn't match, he couldn't have committed the crime. 4.2, 4.3, and the corresponding pattern. Besides comparing Webb's DNA to the evidence, 
It's also compared to the DNA of the victim and the rapist. The dot patterns make the differences between the DNA perfectly clear. None of the DNA matches the DNA from the evidence. This DNA type did not come from Troy Webb, and the true rapist in this case is actually still at large right now. On September 7, 1996, the Innocence Project released the results. In Virginia, where new evidence may not be presented more than 21 days after sentencing, the only option was clemency. The governor reviewed the petition and granted the pardon. There is no greater uh, good that a lawyer can do, in my judgment, than to look back at old cases and if it can be demonstrated that an injustice was done, to write it. On October 16, 1996, Troy Webb emerged from prison a free man. The first thing he wanted to do was eat a seven-foot sub from Philadelphia cold cuts. He now works at the sub shop. He's made new friends and re-established a bond with family. He lives with the same faith and hope that kept him going in prison, and he's grateful to the Innocence Project. They're like family, really, you know, because one for them, I'd probably still be locked up, you know. But they helped me, you know, for free at that, you know. So couldn't ask for too much more. All hope is not lost of catching the real rapist. Virginia has amassed the largest database of DNA in the country by collecting blood samples from every convicted felon. 20, a year. Tens of thousands of blood samples pour in every year, creating a backlog of more than 135,000 samples in cold storage. Still, of the nearly 10,000 DNA profiles in the data bank, Virginia has already solved 18 crimes by matching DNA from the crime scene. If the DNA from the case can be matched with DNA in the data bank, the rapist will be found. Our DNA data bank here was uh, one of the early ones created. I think we had one hit in 1993, none in 1994, and then uh, five in 1995, then 12 in, in 1996 alone. And the database, even in 1996, only numbered less than 9,000 profiles out of those 130,000 samples we have. When we get to the point where we have the convicted felon profiles, all 130,000 of them, the number of these hits is going to skyrocket dramatically until the point at which they are commonplace. If you are innocent of a crime, DNA technology is your, your best friend, your best ally. But conversely, if you're guilty, it's your worst enemy. DNA profiling holds tremendous power for a technology still in its infancy. In its first 10 years, the diminutive double helix has quickly become one of the new detective's biggest allies, bringing criminals to justice and delivering justice to the innocent. A scientist tries to establish when a murder occurred. His only clues are insects collected from the body. Forensic investigators puzzle over a partial skeleton found in a forest. They have two pieces of evidence to work with, a skull and a wasp's nest. In a trash-filled house, detectives find three people dead. Two of the victims are mummified. To solve the bizarre case, investigators rely on dead beetles. Insects may be the only witnesses to a crime, but bugs tell no tales. Or do they? To solve a murder, investigators often must unravel a tangled web of clues.
Sun-kissed Hawaii is a vacationer's dream. Sand, surf, and balmy temperatures lure tourists by the thousands. But life in paradise can have a seamier side. In late December 1989, a search team scoured the forest near a small town on the island of Oahu. They were looking for clues in the disappearance of 32-year-old Roxanne Tandall. Family members were concerned because Roxanne hadn't shown up for work and no one had heard from her in days. Detectives Andrew Glushenko, Joe Self, and Rufus Kaukani received the call that she was missing. Relatives told police this wasn't Roxanne's normal behavior. If she was safe, she would have come home or called. They feared something terrible had happened. They were afraid Roxanne may have been killed. Neighbors believed that she had a violent quarrel with estranged husband, Benjamin, shortly before she disappeared. The couple were about to be divorced, with Roxanne gaining custody of their two sons. Neighbors heard loud noises and several thumps coming from Tandall's house. Suspicion quickly fell on Benjamin Tandall. Although Benjamin had appeared in person to report Roxanne's disappearance, Detective Kaukani thought Tandall's subsequent behavior was odd. What was kind of uh, suspicious about the report that was made by the husband at the Kahuku police station is that the officer asked for an identification, a photograph of her, so they could you know, pass it around. Instead of taking a photograph and taking it back to the station, he picked up clothes and he went to Wailua, which is probably another 20 miles, 15 miles away, to wash clothes. And that's kind of not indicative of somebody who's caring and concerned about a missing person. All right, Dave. Suspicious that like foul play here. might be involved, police obtained a warrant and searched Roxanne's home. If Roxanne was alive, well, perhaps they could find we some clues to, to help locate her. Kitchen or the bathroom, Dave. If Benjamin had kidnapped or killed her, they needed evidence okay, to prove it. Investigators brought with them a Luma light, a device that makes blood and fingerprints visible. The operator's goggles cut through the glare of the bright blue light so he can pick out clues that would otherwise go unnoticed. The light revealed a fine mist of blood droplets on Roxanne's ironing board and in her bedroom. I see those smears, yeah, just like we thought. The search for a missing person suddenly became a murder investigation. Anytime you have a surface with some blood on it and you hit it with a, with a heavy force, it's going to fly out and spatter. And the harder that you hit it, the more force that you use, the finer that the spatter will be. Where was Roxanne Tandall's body? Prosecutors needed it to build a strong case. Without it, her killer would likely go free. Detectives raced against time. In Hawaii's tropical heat and humidity, corpses decay rapidly. Telltale clues can be lost. Evidence tying Roxanne's death to her killer could disappear entirely. A major break in the case came on New Year's Eve, 1989, two weeks after Roxanne's disappearance. Hey guys, I think I found something over here. Searchers found the body of a human female. She had been wrapped in two blankets, both tied securely by fabric strips. Marks on the body suggested she was strangled and hit forcefully on the head. We found our victim, she's about a quarter of a mile south. Although her face was blackened and her body swollen, 
family members recognize the remains as Roxanne's. It's going to be about 5.30. When investigators opened the blankets, flies emerged. Examiner and our forensics team to our location. All right, guys. The next morning, detectives called University of Hawaii entomologist Lee Goff, one of the most respected insect scientists in the United States. How are you, Dr. Goff? Yeah. Detective Glushenko. This is Detective Rufus Kalkani. He's a Hi, Doc. Nice like it or not, insects are mankind's constant companions, thriving alongside us throughout our lives and well afterward. As a forensic consultant, Goff turns the abundance of insects to his advantage. His specialty is using bugs as a kind of biological stopwatch. If detectives hoped to tie this murder to Benjamin Tandall or to anyone else, they needed to get some answers from the bugs. Give them a chance to come back in and start feeling comfortable. Goff would act as their interpreter. Really, when you're dealing with insects, you're looking at the largest group of animals that are on the uh, face of the earth, the largest single group. A conservative estimate, very conservative, would give you three quarters of a million described species. And in reality, I think it's probably much closer to a million. Insects compete with us for food and shelter. At death, we may actually become their food and shelter. That's what Goff counts on. When he arrived at the crime scene, Goff was careful to collect all the insects he could. He snared flying bugs in a net. Others he picked off the body with tweezers. Goff would use the flies to pinpoint when the victim was killed. Because insects live, grow, and die in predictable intervals, their life cycles can be precisely timed out, sometimes down to the hour. And in order to figure out the actual time of death, you have to have as complete a collection as possible of all of the insects that you find on the body. And for each of those insects, then you have to know when they occur on the body and what their, the duration of their life cycle is. If you're working in the early stages of decomposition, say within the first two weeks, what you're really interested in are individual species of flies. In Hawaii's sultry climate, insects thrived on the victim's remains, providing Goff with ample specimens to work with. You look for the most mature uh, specimens that are there, but you try and get a general sampling of everything that's on the body, ex, uh, either on wrappings, clothing, or actually on the surface. Then as the body is removed, you want to look at what's crawling around on the soil underneath the body, because very frequently, especially as decomposition progresses, you find that the center of arthropod activity shifts from the body itself to the kind of interface between the body and the soil, so you'll have a lot of things present there that are very significant in your estimation, that aren't going to actually be on the body. Goff studied the samples at his lab at the University of Hawaii. After the female fly lays her eggs on a dead body, larvae soon develop. They're commonly called maggots. They secrete enzymes and spread bacteria which enable them to consume human tissue. Goff believed that the maggots would tell the tale of the Tandall murder. But would they speak clearly enough to bring a murderer to justice? The life cycle of a fly is closely tied to our own. When a life ends, it's the beginning of a new generation of flies. A dead body is an invaluable source of food for hungry maggots. Flies begin to arrive moments after the host's death. Some unknown chemical from human remains attracts them from up to two miles away. 
As soon as they arrive, the females lay their eggs in protected areas, natural body openings, wounds, and folds of skin. Generally here in Hawaii, the species we deal with, you're looking about 12 to 18 hours between the time the egg is laid and the egg hatches. Then you have your maggot. The maggots then congregate, and they feed together, they form this mass, and they're going to move through the body together. So in any given mass, because not everybody lays their eggs at the same time, you may have maggots of several different species and quite frequently different age classes. As they mature, maggots pass through five stages that entomologists call instars. From infant to adult takes several days to several weeks, depending on species and environmental conditions. Figure out what species is invading a body at a crime scene, observe the particular stage of its development, and you can trace an insect's short life back to the time of death of its human host. Lee Goff did just that to determine precisely when the victim was murdered. Armed with that information, police could check the alibis of any suspects. The initial analysis showed about 10 and a half days of insect activity. I knew it was longer than that. I knew there was a fair amount of literature that would back that up. Goff suspected the tightly wrapped blankets may have delayed the fly's arrival by several days. He realized he would have to fashion an experiment to simulate the same conditions under which the victim's body was discovered. To determine when the victim was killed, Goff relied on a staple of biological research, a dead pig. But to try and pin it down, what I actually did was get a 50-pound pig and duplicate the wrappings and place the animal out in a somewhat similar situation and then determine how long it took for the insects to actually go down and get to the point where they could oviposit on the, uh, on the pig. Goff unwrapped the pig periodically to check for signs of fly eggs. Nearly all of the insects collected from the victim's body were either maggots, adolescent, or adult flies. Although decomposed, it wasn't out long enough to attract many other insect species. After the first couple of weeks, you start running out of flies. And then we have to go into what we call succession. And this works the idea that any insect that feeds on the body is going to change it. And by changing the body, then it makes it attractive to another group of insects. And their feeding makes it attractive to yet another group and so on down the line. During succession, entomologists expect to see a more or less orderly transition from one insect species to another as the bugs arrive at a corpse and begin feeding. Depending on the weather, the numbers and types of insects vary. Goff altered the amount of sun, shade, and water on the pig to mimic what may have happened to the victim's corpse. But how long did it take for the first egg-laying flies to arrive? Goff didn't need to wait long for an answer. He observed the first flies on the pig carcass two and a half days after it was left in the open, wrapped and bound. Goff added the time observed during the pig experiment to his initial time of death estimate of 10 and a half days. He was convinced the victim was murdered no fewer than 13 days before her body was discovered on December 31st. Those extra two and a half days made all the difference. Goff's estimate dovetailed almost exactly with the date of the victim's disappearance and the discovery of her body two weeks later on New Year's Eve. Neighbors told investigators they last saw her in the late afternoon of December 17th. She was sitting stiffly in the passenger seat of Benjamin Tandall's pickup truck.
Brought in by police for questioning, Benjamin agreed to take a lie detector test. He failed. Then he asked for an attorney. Officers charged Benjamin Tandall with the murder of his wife. As they prepared for trial, the prosecution's case was bolstered by additional evidence. Detectives discovered that one of the blankets used to wrap the victim's body matched a photo of a blanket on a sofa in her home. And the blood stains found in her house during the police search matched her blood type. Benjamin Tandall was tried and convicted for the murder of Roxanne Tandall. On November 24, 1989, he was sentenced to life in prison. By establishing the timetable for the murder, Goff turned scattered clues into hard evidence. Whatever Dr. Goff did helped the case a lot, especially during trial. You have a victim, a female victim, who's missing for two weeks. Her husband is giving a story that uh, she had left to go out to a party, to work, and then afterwards she might have gone out with some friends. You run into the possibility that maybe she was killed a week before the body was found as opposed to two weeks. So I think during the trial, Dr. Goff's testimony supported a lot of the circumstantial evidence that we had against the defendant. Um, as far as um, when she was killed. The bugs had spoken, and their wordless testimony allowed a committed team of investigators to bring a killer to justice. Elsewhere, thousands of miles away in the Tennessee mountains, insects helped identify a missing person. A young man on a walk stumbles upon bones that were picked clean. Nearby, a weathered skull held the clue that would help investigators make sense of the jumbled remains. Eastern Tennessee, nestled in the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains, is famous for its fresh air and small town charm. But the rural location also makes it an ideal place to dispose of murder victims. In January 1989, police received a call that a man had discovered a leaf-covered human skeleton. Aside from some bits of tattered cloth and pieces of jewelry, little was left to indicate that this was once a living, breathing person. Police found no identification of any kind, no hints of who the victim might have been. They found no evidence of trauma, yet they suspected foul play. How else would the bones have gotten there? Detectives found little to tell them what happened, except for a dried out wasp's nest, long abandoned by its maker. Would it be enough of a clue? For help with the case, officers of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation contacted forensic anthropologist William Bass. Bass is an expert at reading human remains. He first established the age and sex of the victim. From the shape and size of the bones, he concluded that the skeleton belonged to a female who was not yet 18 when she died. But the cause of her death remained a mystery. Uh, there were no gunshots in the skull. There were no damage to any of the, of the uh, long bones or the bones of the body. Uh, we did not recover the hyoid bone, which is a bone in the neck, and which is one that you get when uh, you, you usually break if you strangle somebody. Although investigators were eager to find out how the girl died, they first tried to determine when she died in the hopes that it might lead to her identity. Boy lives right over here in this house. Where 
as he now. He went on home. I in the summer, uh, the soft tissue on the body in Tennessee uh, will disappear very rapidly. Uh, you can go from what you and I are now to a complete skeleton only about two weeks in July and August in Tennessee. If you die in the winter, it takes longer. But if you die in the winter, by the following, uh, by the following spring or summer, uh, the brain would have decayed and the cranial vault, which is the inside of the skull, the cranial vault would be dry by that time. At the crime scene, Bass looked at the wasp's nest. Knowing when it was made would help them pinpoint the victim's time of death. Wasps need a dry place to build their nests. Bass surmised the skull must have been on the ground for several months before it dried enough to become a suitable home for the insects. So what this tells me is in January when this skull was found, with the wasp nest in it, that individual had been dead and the skull dry the previous summer because this is when this wasp nest at least was, was built. To confirm his findings, Bass contacted forensic entomologist Neil Haskell to help him identify the victim. Haskell consults in criminal investigations all over the U.S. Like all insects, wasps live breed and die in predictable patterns. In Tennessee, they begin nest building in late April or May. By summer, the nest bustles with activity. Then, when the colder weather comes, the wasps die back. The cycle starts over again the following spring. Knowing this life cycle of this particular group of wasps enabled us to come up with a minimum time of the year that it took the wasp to build, plus another six to eight months for the skull to become cleaned and, and dry. In order for the queen wasp to have made her home there, the skull must have been completely dried out by spring 1988. Prior to the wasp's arrival, a brigade of egg-laying flies and carrion beetles must have foraged on the body and cleaned the skull late in the summer of 1987. Both Bass and Haskell concluded that the young girl died no later than midsummer 1987. Uh, we coupled the, the developmental time of the wasp plus the normal insects that eat this carrion and came up with an estimate of at least a year and a half prior to finding this uh, the skeletal remains that the person probably died. Now that was a minimum time. It could have been a little longer. In reality, it turned out that the, uh, uh, the body had actually been out there since uh, February of, of two years prior to the time we found the, the remain. The wasp nest had given investigators the information they desperately sought. Once they knew how long the girl had been dead, they began their hunt for her identity. They narrowed their search to teenage girls reported missing in 1987. They also took note of the jewelry found near the body. Investigators pulled a report detailing the disappearance of a young girl. In a photograph attached to the report, she wore some of the same jewelry found at the crime scene. The girl's name was Michelle Denise Anderson. She was 15 years old when she disappeared. Denise was last seen at a party on January 9th, 1987. When she didn't come home the next day, her mother reported her missing. Until police knew more about her disappearance, they considered Denise a runaway. Investigators had solved only part of the mystery. They knew Denise's name, and because of her age and the condition of the bones, that she was healthy when she died. They are convinced Denise was murdered, but they still don't know how. And no one has ever been charged with her murder. The case remains open. The investigation continues.
The stories that Bugs tell can fill in the missing pieces of a death investigation. For detectives in an Indianapolis suburb, insects would provide the only leads to three bizarre and puzzling deaths. Counted in the trillions, insects vastly outnumber any other creatures on Earth. Florida tropical biologist James Kastner has been studying bugs for 25 years, and the field is definitely growing. Well, approximately 10 years ago, the estimate of total insect species in the world was maybe two to three million. More recently, there's been work done in the rainforest with fogging the treetops and a canopy, and this has now raised the estimate of total world insect species to 30 to 40 million. Insects usually go unnoticed or are shunned altogether. They're maligned for spreading infection, destroying crops, and otherwise making life miserable. But without carnivorous insects and their appetites, the carcasses of dead animals would remain where they fell until bacteria consumed them. Not everyone finds bugs distasteful. Studying insects and other so-called lower life forms is nothing new. It's just becoming more widely practiced and providing better information. Forensic entomologist Jason Bird believes insects have a lot to teach us. Forensic entomology has been around since uh, 13th century China. Uh, it's been used extensively in uh, Europe and Australia, and it's uh, apparently it's pretty slow to catch on in the United States. Uh, it's really only had its current widespread use since uh, the 1950s, and just within the past 10 years alone, it has enjoyed a resurgence of popularity. Despite its obvious benefit to criminal investigation, forensic entomology is not a field of study sought out as enthusiastically as medicine or law. The ranks of forensic entomologists are slim. At most, a few dozen insect specialists in the United States regularly assist with murder cases. People see bugs not as partners, but as pests. Unfortunately, most people treat insects as something creepy and something to recoil and be afraid from. And most of this is a cultural prejudice or just not understanding what insects are all about. I think anybody who takes the time to study insects and to learn how they live, learn the extremely interesting behaviors that they show, can't help but become interested in them, if not enamored with them. The benefits can be many to those detectives willing to overcome their really? distaste for bugs. Insects can make or break an investigation. That's the message brought on this day by insect scientist Neil Haskell, who has come to Wilmington, North Carolina. His mission is simple, to introduce law enforcement to the exotic world of bugs and their ability to crack difficult cases. The ultimate goal is to acquaint the law enforcement folks, the crime scene uh, investigators and uh, coroners, medical examiners with the, first of all, the importance of uh, using entomological evidence in uh, death investigations. Second of all, to train those uh, investigators how to collect, recognize and collect uh, the proper specimens and then how to preserve it and how to uh, ship it and uh, uh, transfer, transfer it to a qualified forensic entomologist for uh, evaluation and analysis. Although insects can't communicate in a conventional sense, their behavior on a dead body can speak volumes to those who know how to listen. Haskell uses dead pigs as stand-ins for dead humans when teaching police officers and evidence technicians the finer points of forensic entomology. In his training sessions, Haskell tries to simulate the real world as best he can. He arranges the pigs as one might find a dead human, covered by brush, hidden out of sight. These pigs have been put out uh, to attract the carrion insects that are forever present in, uh, in most of our environments. And uh, it has been successful because we, we do know that under these carcasses, uh, we're going to be finding some fly larvae 
that have infested the uh, carcasses. And this is what we would find on uh, human remains that have been out for a period of time. Haskell's class is no place for the squeamish. But the things his pupils see here are no worse than what they're likely to find in a real murder investigation. It's time for their next lesson, collecting maggots. We're collecting some of the maggots as preserved specimens. We're also collecting some of the maggots as live specimens. We uh, had the liver that we're going to be growing them on in, in what we call maggot motels. And today we're using liver, beef liver, and we put 15 or 20, 25 maggots in that and then close it up, place it in this, uh, in this can or container and then allow them to grow, monitor them daily or, or every two days to see how they're doing and then, <clears throat> then we can uh, eventually they'll grow to adults and uh, then we can make positive identification of those specimens. Female flies are the insect's first strike on a corpse. If something dies, they'll find it. When a female arrives on decomposing remains, she goes into an egg-laying frenzy. The maggots are the result of the attraction of the chemical smells that are coming from the body that attract the adult flies in. Now the flies uh, have developed uh, and evolved over uh, uh, centuries to select out this specific, very specific kind of food, the rotting tissues of, of dead animals. Yeah, we don't want to start motel ready, please. Yeah. Not all the fly offspring oh, yeah. will survive. But the mother has given her ravenous young a fighting chance by choosing a ready source of sustenance. Get it this way. We got to come around from the other side. This female will deposit uh, anywhere from oh, 150 to maybe up to 400 eggs in a clutch, uh, seeking out sites of, of protection such as the nose, uh, nasal area, mouth. Uh, and eyes. Uh, those eggs will then go through a period of time uh, when they will eventually hatch a few hours to uh, a day or two depending on temperature. The eggs will hatch into first stage larvae which will grow and develop for a few more hours and then shed their skin and go through several more changes. As maggots grow so do their appetites. During their first two stages they never stop eating. The individual maggots form a large mass that eats and moves as one. And while they're in this maggot mass uh, uh, configuration, uh, temperatures within this mass will climb very, very high, uh, 15, even up to 20 degrees centigrade above the normal outside air temperature or ambient temperature. Back in the lab, Haskell examines the mass of maggots. The particular stage and rate of growth of the larvae will provide investigators with a good idea of how long a body has anyway, been left in the open. The maggots act as filters. And that's what these they can be tested for chemicals and, and drugs they may have picked up from their host. For those of us who know how to listen, insects can be vocal witnesses to the circumstances of a person's death. In November 1987, residents of a middle-class Indianapolis suburb phoned police. They were worried that they hadn't seen their elderly male neighbor for a number of days. He lived there with his invalid sister and aunt. Police arrived at the house. When no one answered, they entered. The house was a complete mess. Investigators found refuse of all sorts in the kitchen. Unwashed dishes, uneaten meals, discarded silverware, and empty packages. Bags of decaying food moldered in the garage. Then police found the homeowner, collapsed on the living room floor, apparently dead for some time. Not certain what they were facing, investigators called for backup. As more detectives arrived, neighbors began to congregate. Nearly every inch of the house was covered with trash.
Police wondered what kind of person could live like this. The officers cautiously inspected every room. The search quickly took a bizarre twist. What this? Gosh. Oh, yeah? Investigators were shocked to find the mummified remains of two women in a pair of back bedrooms. Since the cause of death wasn't readily apparent, police assumed murder. Sergeant Reggie Roney recalls the grisly discovery. We're treating this as a homicide scene because we don't know what has happened here. And uh, my first view of the body is, is there's no body. All that's left is clothing and, and it's kind of like a mummy laying there on the bed. And I look at it and I can see the little skull caps that the older women used to wear and uh, bed sheets and I can tell all the bodily fluids have gone see through the mattress and it's just a skeletal type mummy. The only evidence seemed to be an abundance of bugs, beetles mostly, found on the bodies of both women. Whatever happened here wasn't an ordinary death scene. It would take extraordinary means to sort it all out. Investigators on the scene of the triple deaths faced a double mystery. How did the victims die and how long had they been dead? Autopsies would probably answer the first question, but the second one seemed unsolvable. At the crime scene, detectives meticulously cataloged each piece of evidence, including several dead flies and the dried husks shed by beetles, called cast skins. Each insect type was a valuable clue, but investigators weren't certain how to read the evidence. They also gathered samples of an unusual brown stringy material found near both bodies. Baffled by what they found, they realized they needed the help of a forensic entomologist. They called on Neil Haskell. He met members of the Indiana University Medical Center forensic science team at the morgue for an autopsy. Obviously, we had uh, to determine how long these individuals had been there because in the investigation it was important to pinpoint time of death. Obviously, who these, these individuals are, uh, when they died, and, and possibly where they died, and how they died. And so each one of the, the different forensic disciplines uh, was, was providing pieces of that puzzle together. For Haskell, that meant identifying the particular insect species that colonized each of the women's remains. Thank you. Haskell noted a curious difference between the two female mummies. One's face contained most of the original flesh, while the second did not. From the second body, Haskell collected numerous empty puparia, or casings. These, he knew, were left behind by juvenile blowflies as they hatched into adulthood. But the first set of mummified remains was marked only by dead beetles. Why the difference? Haskell knew that decomposing remains almost immediately attract egg-laying female flies. Okay, Judging from the amount of flesh still on the body of one of the mummies, flies seem to have ignored it altogether. Insects are weather dependent. Their development is controlled by the seasons. Haskell suspected that weather had played a role. To gather more evidence, he visited the house where the bodies were discovered.
In both bedrooms, he found beetle cast skins. But in one bedroom was an abundance of intact, dead beetles. In that room, he collected specimens of three different species. The blinds had been pulled down. They were down, but behind those blinds, as, as I raised the blinds and searched the room, uh, there were, were uh, a couple hundred uh, adult dried beetles that had, had come from the body and had tried to reach the out of doors and gone to the windows and could get no further. And so then they died on the window sills. Haskell was still puzzled by the pencil shaving like substance found next to the dead beetles on the woman's body. At first, he theorized it was a kind of fungus. Then he remembered that a similar material had been found on a body in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1962. In his laboratory, Haskell put the substance under a microscope. As others had in the Copenhagen case, he identified the substance as beetle feces excreted by the larvae. The feces is associated with remains that have been mummified for long periods. As detectives continued their search of the home, they found a diary written by the ant. In her last entry, dated October 5, 1977, the ant reported that her health was failing, and so was the health of her niece. Neither, the ant wrote, had long to live. This information helped Haskell with his investigation. He theorized that the ant, whose remains were more skeletonized than her nieces, must have died when the flies were still active. That would have been no later than autumn. The ant's body had less flesh because the flies arrived during warmer weather laid their eggs, and their larvae had cleaned the skeleton. Haskell concluded that the ant, the older of the pair, died first in October 1977. The niece likely would have died in late December 1977, or perhaps early January 1978. The niece's body was better preserved because her death came in the coldest part of the year. There simply were no egg-laying flies around to be attracted to the chemical signals emanating from her remains. They got up moved in the middle of the night. <laughs> the mystery of when the women died was solved. Other questions persisted. Why were the women kept in the house for 10 years after they died? Police could only speculate on the details of their lives. The diary helped fill in some of the missing pieces. The ant had fallen in the backyard and broken her hip. She could no longer get around. Soon after the ant was injured, her niece also broke her hip. The man looked after both women around the clock as their health continued to fail. After his aunt died, the man decided to keep her in the house rather than alert anyone to her passing. Shortly after, his sister died. He decided to keep her death a secret as well. He managed to maintain the charade for 10 years. To avoid being discovered, he always ordered enough groceries for three people. He refused to allow the delivery person to bring them into the house for fear the smell would be noticed. He insisted that the bags be slipped under the garage door. That explained the sacks of uneaten food rotting in the garage. As the weather warmed, the odors from the bodies surely would have been difficult to live with.
To the neighbors, the man was friendly enough, but he kept them at arm's length. When asked about the health of his aunt or sister, he'd be noncommittal. Sometimes he'd complain that the women were keeping him up all night or give details of their failing health. Remarkably, the neighbors kept their distance and never set foot in his home. As detectives investigated further, the final piece of the puzzle fell into place. They discovered that the man received at least $140,000 in fraudulent social security checks after the women's deaths. But that may have only been part of the reason. Perhaps the decision to keep the bodies was motivated more by compassion than greed. He had cared for them so long and, and, and you know, looked at them and looked after them 24 hours on a daily, daily basis. Uh, I think that he just probably couldn't bring himself to, to, to uh, uh, give up his, his loved ones. No charges were ever filed in the case of the Indianapolis mummies. The trio's deaths were officially recorded as due to natural causes. Before they died, they named their church as the beneficiary of the estate. The social security money owed to the government was partially paid back by the sale of the property. The bugs had helped detectives solve the curious case of the Indianapolis mummies. However unusual, it was one investigation among hundreds for insect specialists like Neil Haskell. Haskell says that bugs are becoming powerful allies in an age when sophisticated technology is figuring more and more into criminal cases. One example is the analysis of human DNA found in the blood that bugs take from human bodies. The mosquito is uh, feed and it swells up. Its abdomen swells. That's a, that's a human blood meal in there. And you can analyze that blood meal uh, for human DNA. And it works in, in uh, mosquitoes, bed bugs, fleas, and lice now. Tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous tool. The study of insects is the study of the great tenacity and variety of life. Yet modern science has much to learn about insect life, especially as it applies to investigating death. According to entomologist Lee Goff, many details are still unknown. We need to put uh, forensic entomology on a firmer statistical basis. Uh, right now, the statistical basis is just beginning to be developed, and we need to see more modeling in terms of what's going on with the corpses. So there's an awful lot of research. I think probably I've got more questions now than I had when I got into it 15 years ago. Here we go. As methods improve, as more scientists enter the field and learn more about insect behavior, the value of forensic entomology will grow. Well, when we first started, actually, I'd go back to 15 years ago when I first became involved in forensic entomology. Uh, law enforcement agencies thought we were a little bit nuts and really were a little skeptical that we'd be able to give them anything that would be of use. Over the past 15 years, by working very diligently with the different agencies and the different uh, groups of people, we've been able to convince them that, in fact, it is a very powerful uh, tool for use in their investigation. So I'd say now it's uh, very widely accepted. No matter how technical our world becomes, the simplest methods are sometimes the best. And sometimes the least likely sources are the most dependable. Slowly, homicide investigators are beginning to realize the invaluable contributions made by the smallest witnesses to murder.